Thank you, councillors. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the city of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make here today. Amen. Amen. Brisbane City Council acknowledges this country and its traditional custodians. We acknowledge and respect the spiritual relationship between traditional custodians and this country, which has inspired language, songs, dances, lore and dreaming stories over many thousands of years. We pay our respects to the elders, those who have passed into the dreaming, those here today, those of tomorrow. May we continue to peacefully walk together in gratitude, respect and kindness in caring for this country and one another. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Toomey, Councillor Owen and Councillor Hammond will be absent today and I move that they be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that Councillors Toomey, Owen and Hammond be granted leaves of absence from today's meeting. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,707th meeting held on Tuesday the 2nd of May 2023 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the minutes of the 4,707th meeting of Council held on the 2nd of May 2023 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Uh, welcome new councillors, Councillor Tina Trina Massey and Councillor Lucy Collier, welcome. I'm sure we look forward to your later contributions. Um, councillors, we do have a public participant this morning who will be bringing, coming forward now, uh, Levi Wilson, who asked to address the, count, the Chamber on Brisbane's bus network. And uh, while Levi is taking, coming to the, to the microphone, uh, I'd like to acknowledge in the public gallery a visitor from Canada. Uh, Mr Ned Taylor, a former councillor for the district of Saanich in Vancouver, on Vancouver Island. Welcome, welcome. Hope you enjoy proceedings here today. Levi, thank you. You have uh, five minutes once you, once you start. Good afternoon all. Brisbane is the best city in the world, with small businesses, sport teams, music scenes and something on nearly every day of the week, it's no wonder we were chosen to host the 2032 Olympics. With the school year already a quarter of the way through and people are well and truly in the swing of their work lives, it's hard to ignore the overwhelming levels of traffic within our city. Roads are packed on a daily basis and we need to look at solutions for this dilemma. Road improvements may temporarily help our problems, but they cost valuable time and money to produce. If only there were some sort of ride share service which could take hundreds, if not thousands of people off the roads. Worry not, because the solution for our delay is buses. According to census data collected in 2016 and 2020, buses saw a 61% drop in use for regular commutes. However, not all hope is lost. Public, the public needs council support in order to help change this narrative and help shape the way we use our public transport. The benefits of public transport are enormous. Studies have proven that effective use of public transport sees a reduction in congestion, less motor fatalities, road maintenance budgets reduce, and citizens having better access to jobs in the community. Right now, you might be thinking, another young greenie here to convince us to jump on buses. Like many, I need my car for my job. I work in disability support. And while the idea of cleaner air quality appeals to me greatly, I know one thing we can all get around, money. If one thing could bring Pink Floyd, ABBA and Lime Cordial all together, it would be money. We could be saving thousands of dollars a week with more investment in our buses. Cars put literal pressure on our road, roads, leading to potholes and other damage. These are huge hazards for drivers and cost our city millions of dollars to repair. By having less drivers, we can extend the shelf life of our tarmac. Congestion is also a fuel burner. 
um, we throw away litres of fuel just being stuck in stop-start traffic. And trust me, when fuel is $2 a litre, I'd rather spend my mo money on better things. Time is also money. Getting to my client takes 45 minutes outside of peak hour. Getting home in peak hour is an hour 30. Imagine a world, <laughs> sorry, imagine what you could do with 45 minutes. Play with your dog, get your kids to soccer practice, you could even have your coffee and drink it. By now, you've, by now you're starting to see why public transport is important. But why are people not taking advantage of our buses now? Let's face it, they have a bit of an image issue. I asked my community what would make buses more appealing. Cost and service were major reasons people didn't want to get on board. Ultimately, buses also get caught in congestion. So how, do we, how can we bring people on board? Quicker and frequent buses to key busy locations is important. Westfield Chermside is the second biggest shopping centre in Australia. From where I live, it takes 20 minutes to take the bus, including a 15 minute walk. Compare this to a five minute drive from my house. Imagine a world where your teenagers could hop on the bus to get to the shops and you could relax at home instead of driving them. Frequent buses will also reduce crowding. The, rea the reality is that no one wants to stand up during bus travel, especially when you finish your work day, you may not smell or look as good when you walked out the door, your legs hurt and you're tired. In a time when infection and control immediately comes to mind, we need to be aware of the public's perception of buses. Now, with all my suggestions in mind, how do we incentivize the public to skip the car and hop on a bus? This all circles back to the true root of all evil, money. Make it free. If free isn't an option, make it cheap. Commuters want value for their money and spending $50 a week for a bus doesn't sit well. If a taxpayer is paying for subsidies for a free public transport network, they're more likely to want to take advantage of a system which benefits them. Free transport is also linked to positive economic activity and more access to better paying jobs. Remember, Brisbane is a truly amazing city. Let's spend more time showing what our city is capable of and less time stuck behind brake lights. Thank you, Levi. Councillor Murphy, would you like to respond? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Levi, for sharing your uh, thoughts on the bus network in Brisbane. As an avid bus user, I'm sure that you know uh, that buses do the heavy lifting when it comes to public transport here in Brisbane. Two thirds of all public transport trips in this city are actually taken on a bus. A lot of people think it's trains that do it, but it's buses that do the heavy lifting. Uh, and we know that this council is investing heavily in public transport in Brisbane. In fact, we are delivering the highest level of investment in buses and ferries on record, and we are also delivering a brand new transport option with the Turn Up and Go Brisbane Metro, uh, which, uh, as you identified, involves a comprehensive review of Brisbane's bus network as it stands. We are uh, the fastest growing capital city in the country, and um, that's only going to continue to gather pace as we head towards the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2032 and more and more people get to know where Brisbane is and want to move here for the obvious uh, lifestyle benefits and the reasons that many of us live here. Uh, by 2041, we know our population will increase by almost 25 per cent. The way we travel in Brisbane is therefore changing and our population is growing, so we know we have to consistently strive to make our network more efficient and reliable for travellers now uh, and into the future. As you may be aware, the state government is the authority responsible uh, for public transport across the whole state of Queensland. Uh, here at Brisbane City Council, we operate our bus services under a contract with the state government's uh, transit authority, which you know as TransLink. This means that while our, our bus drivers are Brisbane City Council employees and our buses are blue and yellow, uh, ultimately the state government is responsible for approving and funding changes uh, to the network. And it's disappointing that we have seen a lack of uh, growth funding for the bus network in this state in recent years. And in fact, we've, uh, we've done reviews and essentially the, the network size or the amount of funding that goes into the network has been relatively the same or has matched uh, we've been slightly under inflation for the last decade. So it's no wonder uh, that, that we have seen 
uh, public transport patronage flatline and actually decline uh, somewhat. It makes, it, it makes it extremely hard for council to deliver uh, new services, but the Schrinner Council is extremely passionate about improving uh, public transport, and we do that by providing a public transport subsidy. At council, we contribute to the cost of all public transport services in Brisbane. In fact, our contribution to public transport in this city is bigger than the contribution made by every other Australian capital city combined. No other local government in Queensland subsidises public transport in this way. And to meet increasing demand for fast and efficient public transport, our investment will increase by 84 per cent uh, to $183 million by the 2025-2026 uh, financial year. So a very, very significant increase uh, from this council that is not matched uh, by the state government. And on top of that, we are also solely uh, funding, along with uh, some federal contributions, the Brisbane Metro uh, project, which will deliver new bi-articulated high-capacity uh, metro vehicles and upgraded infrastructure across the busway network. Unfortunately, uh, the answer to improving public transport services in Brisbane is not as simple as just providing more buses. Uh, the ad old adage, um, just add one more lane to solve congestion on roads, uh, as you've identified, uh, it actually also applies to buses in this city. And just adding more buses into our network doesn't necessarily solve the congestion problem uh, that we have. What we do need to do is make better use of um, infrastructure and resources that we already have in order to uh, maximise capacity and improve that passenger experience that you've identified as, is really critical to getting people back on our network. So we know that changes need to be made to our bus network um, and we need to review the network to integrate high frequency turn up and go metro services and ensure that Brisbane Metro, Cross River Rail and all of the other modes deliver an integrated network. That is, that is the hope, that's what we're aiming for. Um, as uh, you mentioned, we have recently undertaken consultation on Brisbane's new bus network. Um, as part of those changes, we are combining a number of routes to simplify the network uh, and some with extremely low patronage are being removed. The new network will allow us to make better use of our resources to deliver high frequency services to more streets. Um, again, as you've identified, that lack of frequency is one of the reasons why people stay off public transport because the car becomes more reliable than a bus or, or a train and so uh, it's our job uh, to solve that. But what's important to know about our new network is that uh, it is not about cuts. In fact, the network that we have proposed represents a significant investment in new services. As I mentioned, Council is uh, in fact uh, the only level of government that is investing significantly in new services for, uh, for Brisbane. Um, just finally, I just want to note your suggestion to make public uh, transport free or, or, or cheaper. And um, look, there are many things that many economists will tell you about um, you know, making something free and the perceived value of that dropping. And then um, you know, cities that are where public, uh, free public transport has worked and cities where uh, free or low cost public transport has actually resulted in uh, drops in patronage. So um, there's, a whole, there's a whole range of um, uh, uh, particularly uh, European cities where you can have a look at um, the results of that. Councillor Johnston. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, Levi, Council operates its bus services under a contract from Translink, so we ultimately don't have the responsibility to set the fares. That is um, with the state government. They set ticket prices and ultimately they are the ones who have the responsibility to make public transport uh, free. However, at Council we do do uh, our part to try and encourage residents on to public transport to help with the um, soaring cost of living uh, by running a number of free uh, bus services. For example, here in the heart of the CBD, we run the free city loop that runs every 10 minutes from 7am to 6pm. We also operate the Spring Hill loop in Councillor Howard's uh, ward and we are currently trialling a free South Brisbane uh, loop in Councillor uh, Massey's uh, electorate which runs along Gray Street, Montague Road, Vulture Street and um, Tribune Street. We also offer free off-peak travel uh, to seniors, which subsidises the cost of travel for seniors and makes it easier for our oldest residents to get around the city during the day uh, time for free. Um, and we, we actually have to pay the state government to run that service. They don't, uh, you know, that, so council is essentially subsidising all seniors to travel off-peak in the city uh, for free. Um, and uh, would you believe since we started that initiative in October, uh, 2019, seniors have saved more than $8 million in fares as a result of that initiative alone. So that's a great outcome for the city's senior citizens. So, uh, Levi, we remain focused on delivering the best public transport outcomes in the city for as many uh, people as possible, whilst also ensuring um, a record investment in public transport is spent responsibly. 
so I want to thank you uh, for your time today, Levi, for coming in for your presentation. Certainly uh, there are some ideas there that are very worthy of consideration because it's all in our interest to improve public transport patronage. Thank you. Thank you, Levi, for coming in. Councillors, are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a Civic Cabinet Chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Mackay. Yeah, thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, today you released the Chelmer to Indrapilly River Crossing Report, a document which presents a number of options to help reduce congestion in Brisbane's inner western suburbs. <laughs> Councillor Johnston, please. Can you please update the Chamber on the findings of this report, including the next steps? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mackay, for the question through you, Mr Chair. And yes, uh, certainly today uh, we did release uh, the document that uh, highlights what comes next and what happens next when it comes to options to improve infrastructure uh, through the corridor between Chelmer and Indrapilly, uh, otherwise known as the Walter Taylor Bridge Corridor. And uh, a lot of people aren't aware that um, Walter Taylor Bridge has a uh, really fascinating history. It was uh, a fully privately funded bridge um, and it was an early use of recycling because uh, a private entity um, got a hold of some cables that were used in the construction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And they used those cables as the basis to create uh, a suspension bridge, uh, which then turned into uh, a tollway. Uh, it was opened on Valentine's Day in 1936, 87 years ago, at a cost of £87,000. Seems like a bargain, um, seems like a bargain. One thing's for sure is that whatever we do there in the future between the three levels of government is going to cost more than 87,000 uh, pounds. We know that more than a decade ago, we started work on uh, the go-between bridge and that project cost uh, in excess of 300 million um, a decade ago. Uh, so costs continue to escalate on every major project uh, because of uh, inflation and also the massive demand. And so what we're seeing now is uh, the options that we've had a look at uh, that could involve uh, duplicating a bridge or constructing uh, new bridges uh, range from between $800 million and $1.3 billion. Uh, it effectively would require two bridge structures, one bridge structure across the Brisbane River and another one across the railway corridor which would be almost as expensive as crossing the river. Uh, and so... Councillor Johnston, please. Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnston, please. And so, Johnston. And so we've put forward uh, a range of different options for consideration. And now the next step is to sit down with the state government in a joint working group uh, to progress these options and narrow it down further. Let's work out what are the most feasible options. And once we do that, and once we sit down with the state and work out the next steps, uh, then we can narrow down those uh, options to just a small number of options, which we can then go out to the community with. Uh, so this is a process. Uh, this is a project uh, that will need to be done jointly between the different levels of government. Certainly, nothing can happen without the support and approval of the state government. Uh, any, there's a whole heap of interactions with the railway corridor uh, and also um, bridges across the R Brisbane River um, uh, you know, become incredibly complex, particularly when they're involving crossing railway lines as well. So uh, we've had the support of Minister Mark Bailey for progressing this and I look forward to his ongoing support in taking this to the next steps. Uh, but certainly we know the critical thing is that people want uh, action when it comes to reducing traffic congestion. They want better travel options. Uh, they want to see improvements. Uh, if you look at uh, the top three um, suggested improvements that residents supported uh, when it comes to that corridor, uh, the most popular was a second bridge. The next one was widening the existing bridge, um, which I'm a little bit concerned about because from an engineering perspective that is simply not possible. Uh, but also uh, improve tra public transport. And as we know, uh, that location has a railway line, there's a railway bridge through that corridor, uh, and a railway line servicing the, the corridor through Chelmer and Indrapilly. Uh, there's also a bikeway bridge as well, which links into our new Indrapilly Riverwalk uh, and other destinations in the local area. So 
looking at the range of different opportunities, but certainly investigating what um, an additional bridge would look like, what are the most feasible options. I'm keen to progress this to the next step. Uh, with this scale of investment, uh, between 800 million and 1.3 billion at this preliminary stage. This is a project that would need the support of all levels of government. It's not something that council could or would go alone on, uh, but certainly with the support of the state government, uh, we get to the next important step and next milestone. Uh, and this is also a project that could be considered potentially through the city deal arrangement, which would uh, make sense. It would see all three levels of government contributing to what uh, would be important transport infrastructure uh, in that Western Corridor. So I do look forward to working with uh, Minister Bailey and progressing uh, these opportunities, well, narrowing down the well, options your and coming time up has with expired. some solutions. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Well, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, community housing providers build housing for people, not profit. Brisbane City Council is now becoming one of the hardest and most expensive places for affordable housing to be built. Rates are high, infrastructure charges are high and development fees are high. Why is the LNP making it so hard for community housing providers to develop new housing in Brisbane? Councillor Allen. Well, uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank uh, Councillor Cassidy for the question. Uh, the premise of the question, unfortunately, is, is false, um, demonstrably false. But uh, what I will point out is that uh, this council provides not only rates discounts for community housing providers, but we also provide um, infrastructure charges discounts as well. So um, the, the notion that we're not doing anything to support this and that we are in fact making it difficult is uh, absolutely a nonsense. We work closely with community Councilor housing. Cassidy, please stop interjecting. We work closely with community housing providers where they have projects and certainly assist them actively in the uh, process of uh, looking at development Councilor approvals Cassidy. and achieving the outcomes and approvals they need to build their property. So uh, this notion that we're not supporting them is totally incorrect. We are also currently looking closely at um, you know, the, the build to rent sector, um, the community housing providers could be um, considered to be in that particular space. They provide um, long-term housing on a, a reduced rental basis and so we will be looking closely to see whether we can support um, the community housing provider sector through our build to rent incentives. So uh, the, um, the approach from this administration is to work very, very closely with them. We truly appreciate the kind of product they're providing into the market and the work they do for the wider community in Brisbane. Um, but in summary, Councillor Cassidy's notion is totally false and it's misleading and it's unfortunate that he would take that approach. Thank you for the questions. Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance and City Governance Committee, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham, tonight the federal government will hand down their budget for the 23-24 financial year. Historically, Brisbane City Council has received funding for many of its infrastructure projects, which has allowed us to keep up with our city's growth. Can you please update the Chamber on what you hope to see in the upcoming federal budget? Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, thanks to Councillor Huang for the question. Over many years, Brisbane City Council has enjoyed a strong relationship with respective federal governments of both political persuasions. Local government truly is the level of government closest to the people, and we know that we can be strong partners with other levels of government to deliver projects of local and strategic importance. In Brisbane, we continuously punch above our weight, delivering significant projects and contributing significant funding to others. But, Mr Chair, we simply can't do it alone. Local government levies just 3 per cent of overall taxation revenue in Australia, compared to 16 per cent at the state level and 81 per cent from Canberra. So we need federal support. We are appreciative of the support that we have received over the years. Financial assistance grants from the federal government are a valued contribution, providing ongoing support to the work of local government. We've received nearly $400 million of funding through these grants over the past decade. 
This support is critical and we hope it continues and grows, noting the cost pressures we all face. We have also had a great support from major transport projects in the past. When Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was the Infrastructure Minister in the previous Labor government, we had half a billion dollars committed towards Legacy Way. This funding was then honoured by the incoming Coalition Government after 2013. Mr Chair, we are Australia's fastest growing capital city. The ABS recently confirmed this. Our growth rate in Brisbane is more than triple the growth rate of Sydney and more than double that of Melbourne. All of this means we need more federal funding for roads and public transport to protect our lifestyle in Brisbane. So, Mr Chair, we note with concern the recently announced review of federally funded infrastructure projects. We have pending federal funding commitments totalling $91 million for Beams Road, $50 million for the state-led Beams Road rail overpass and $41 million for Council's Beams Road upgrade from Lacey Road to Hanford Road. Federal Senator Anthony Chisholm was happy to pose for photos on Beams Road with his state Labor colleagues and Councillor Wines at a press conference in February. We certainly hope Senator Chisholm's commitment to the northern suburbs is worth the same at the end of the federal funding review as what it was in February. Councillors will recall that we moved a motion to ensure that the federal government retained its commitment to Mogul Road at Kenmore, and we are hoping that this budget and review that is being undertaken as announced by the Minister will not see funding for traffic congestion in the western suburbs of Brisbane cut. This $12.5 million towards the state government section of Mogul Road is essential in tackling congestion in the western suburbs. The former Coalition Government's Local Roads and Community Infrastructure Program saw $87.6 million received by Brisbane City Council between 2020 and 2022, delivering dozens of projects, big and small, right across our suburbs. These projects were aligned with the Schrinner Council's priorities to deliver better and safer roads to reduce congestion and also to improve our community and sporting facilities. The Coalition announced a two-year $500 million extension in the May 22 budget, and we welcomed the confirmation in the October 22 budget of a further $250 million extension. However, Mr Chair, the devil was in the detail. We have just discovered here at Brisbane City Council, Australia's largest local government representing nearly 5 per cent of the national population, that we will not get one cent of this additional funding. Not one cent. The Albanese government has dictated that the additional $250 million in funding for roads through LRCI is not to go to urban local governments like Brisbane, based on an arbitrary classification system. We're certainly used to being ripped off by the state government in this regard, Mr Chair, but it's disappointing and, frankly, bewildering to see this now from Canberra. So, Mr Chair, we certainly hope that Council's positive relationship with Canberra will continue after the Treasurer hands down the federal budget tonight. But, Mr Chair, the early signs are not promising. Thank you, Councillor. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. Oh, no. I move to suspend standing orders, allowing me to move a motion in relation to the federal government's local roads and community infrastructure program. Seconded. We have a motion for the suspension of standing rules to allow the Deputy Mayor to move a motion under 12.3 of the meeting's local law. Um, Deputy Mayor, you have th up to three minutes to establish Point the reason order. for your motion. Councillor Johnson. Yes, um, Mr Chairman. Point of order, are you raising a point of yes, order? Yes, I did say point of order, yeah. and that's why I'm standing. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Councillor Johnson. Um, uh, urgency motions now uh, can only be moved if there is um, a reason that they could not have been put on the agenda by midday on Monday. <laughs> Uh, given that the funding arrangements uh, for these issues have been fully known for several years, as outlined in some detail by the Finance Chairman, um, I'm seeking your ruling, Mr Chairman, on why this has become urgent in the last 12 hours. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I'll listen to the Deputy Mayor's argument as to why it couldn't be put forward on the agenda before one o'clock yesterday afternoon. As it says under the local laws, a suspension of standing orders is for motions that cannot make it by one o'clock on a Monday, and I would like to explain why that is the case in this. Not because we decided for political gains, but this is about supplying money for people of Brisbane. 
This was not submitted by 1pm yesterday because it became aware this morning. This morning that phase four of the LRCI allocations announced today have been restricted to rural, regional and outer metro councils okay. and community infrastructure programs are no longer eligible. Not that we'll get any of those as well. We heard the details just then from Councillor Cunningham in her answer about the impacts that this funding is going to have on Brisbane. We see that the Australian Local Government Association has also raised concerns about the government's decision on this matter. For this reason, as the fastest growing city in Australia, I think it is very important this council debate this matter to send a strong message to relation to the lack of funding our city is going to miss out on due to the announcement this morning by the Albanese federal government. Thank you. We have a motion for the suspension of standing rules. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called. No seconder. Deputy Mayor, can you move your motion, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Point of order. Point Sorry, of order. Mr. Chairman. Um, given that uh, the Deputy Mayor has indicated that she was advised about this this morning, or Council was advised about this this morning, will she table the correspondence that has been received? Uh, so that we can understand before we have this important debate what it is the state, uh, the is federal government has actually announced. This, that's not a point of order. Deputy uh, Mayor, can I you move just, your motion, please? Yes, I will move the motion. I move that this council supports the Australian Local Government Association in urgently calling for the federal government to not exclude metropolitan councils like Brisbane in the 250 million local roads and community infrastructure program Phase 4B. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded. Okay. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. So, there is no correspondence. It was announced this morning in the media under phase four of LRCI allocations. There is a website, investment.infrastructure.gov.au, around phase four funding, which clearly says it is restricted to rural, regional and outer metro councils. Capital cities, and in the case of our outer metro um, councils, Logan as well, are no longer eligible for LRCI right. funding at all, community or roads. This is an absolute disgrace. At the last federal election, voters went to the polls with the information that both sides of politics, Labor and Liberal, would continue to fund LRCI grants as part of their re-election re pitches to Brisbane voters. In fact, Labor promised to increase this funding above the $500 million already allocated by the former government by adding an additional $250 million. So Brisbane ratepayers were rightly expecting that they would have a share of this extra funding to deliver local initiatives such as road upgrades. The federal government came out this morning to say that this extra money must be spent on roads and unfortunately, that Brisbane would not be getting a cent. Dang. Roads, community or otherwise. So we saw the local uh, uh, government association, Australian Local Government Association, although they've welcomed the extra 250 million, which is great if you're outside of major cities, they need to reinstate the former model that saw it provided to all councils, to all councils. It is absolutely outrageous as the fastest growing capital in the country that they've decided not to fund one project in our LGA area. Why is Brisbane missing out on funding when there are projects this funding can go towards? There are so many examples of federal funding which have positively contributed to Brisbane as a city. Just last year, we received several LRCI programs for a number of projects. I have to say, in my local area, the Whites Hill Reserve upgrades for the road in that community precinct, where thousands of patrons can now travel more efficiently and safely when they participate at the largest regional sporting precinct on the south side when it comes to the numbers of people through that precinct weekly. 
We saw $7.1 million to Wadeville Street and Ritchie Road Corridor, $4.5 million to the Witten Barracks Community Hub, $4.3 million for the Sean Clip Escarpment. I hope that didn't have anything else left to finish on it for the Councillor of Deegan. $6 million for Brisbane International Cycle Park, $900,000 for the Ipswich Road Tunnel Lighting, $230,000 for Kelvin Grove Urban Village Lighting and $250,000 for Brackenridge Scouts and Girl Guides. And now, not only will none of that be seen across the country, but they, the federal government doesn't believe that Brisbane notarists deserve a fair share of this funding. We need to send a strong message to the federal government that we support Australia's local government association and calls to provide funding to councils, not just those that are living outside the capital city. I call again for all councillors to support this motion because Brisbane deserves their fair share of infrastructure as well. Thank you. Further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thanks very much, Chair. And where, where was the LNP? Where was the Deputy Mayor when the Morrison government racked up a trillion dollars in debt for this nation uh, and, and allocated, um, uh, from memory from this fund a couple of years ago, $600 million to car parks that were never built and then that money had to be reallocated. I mean, th this whole issue of around, around pork barrelling from the former Morrison government, which didn't do Julian Simmons any good out in the western suburbs, they've talked an awful lot about um, federal funding going into the leafy western suburbs of Brisbane. That didn't do Julian any good. So isn't, isn't there a clear message in the last federal election that if you try and buy votes with public money uh, and you are incredibly transparent about that, yes. that people in this day and age are actually rejecting that. Because what we do see, we see the results of those political decisions. We see less money being able to be spent on important things and we see that at a council level. Now today the LNP will do anything, Chair, anything to not talk about their own budget and their own failings and their own cost blowouts, which then lead on to less investment in the suburbs of Brisbane. So the criticism they're levelling at the moment at another level of government is exactly what they are doing in the suburbs of Brisbane, but they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to talk about it. But we will be talking about it in the suburbs of Brisbane. The Deputy Mayor got up and said, oh, gee, she hopes that the Shauncliffe Escarpment didn't need any more work after the federal money dries up because this LNP Council has no money to invest in our open spaces. The Deputy Mayor just let the cat out of the bag then. Local park Point upgrades order, cannot Point be order to you, Deputy Mayor. without federal Point money. Order. Point of order. Councilor Thank Cassidy. you, Councillor Cassidy. Cassidy. Uh, claim to be misrepresented. Noted. She said, gee, I hope there doesn't need order. to be any more well, done on the short of the Cassidy, another point of order. after the federal uh, money finishes. Me, Councillor Cassidy, point of order. Cassidy. I prefer not to be called she. Yes, Councillor, Councillor, please. can you refer to councillors by their proper titles, please? Councillor Adams said, gee, I hope there doesn't need to be any more work on the shrunk of escarpment after the federal money wraps up. A council project, a council project that not one single cent is being put in by this administration. So that tells you, I think, all you need to know about this political approach from this LNP administration. When you've got you know, at a federal level, a trillion dollars in debt that a government of, of, any, of any persuasion over the future has to deal with, a structural deficit at a federal level of $40 billion going forward. So, of course, decisions need to be made about that. And you've got, you've got a structural deficit in the Brisbane City Council budget that clearly can only be plugged by money coming from other levels of government um, and now through what we will see is astronomically high rate rises and an enormous amount of borrowing which is going to be put uh, onto future generations of Brisbane residents. So this is just... Uh, that was laughable when the Deputy Mayor got up and said... when the Deputy Mayor got up and said, oh, this isn't about political point scoring. That's what this is all about. It's about obfuscation. It's about uh, trying to get people to look somewhere else when we're approaching a council budget where Councillor Murphy uh, doesn't know what the price of the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge is going to be by the end of it, where the Lord Mayor has no idea how much the Metro is going to end up being. Uh, he announced today a bridge that will cost somewhere between $800 million and $1.3 billion. Uh, they, can't, they can't do public 
Point of order. Point of order to you. Will Deputy. Councillor Cassidy take a question? Uh, Councillor Cassidy, will you take a question? Well, we were in question time. I did. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, that's... The Deputy that's, Mayor got just, up. The Deputy Mayor got up and, and, and stop the, that. And question, stop that. There's a question. Will you take a question? Yes. Yes. I'm just wondering if you're supporting the motion or not. Uh, oh. Well, actually, I was, I was, I, I, just four minutes. I was going to wrap up, but maybe I'll go longer. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll keep going. Maybe I'll keep going. Yeah. I mean, this is a this is a joke. Uh, this is a joke. I mean, and and a little simple Google, a little simple Google search um, would suggest that five days ago this uh, information was out in the public domain. So the ALGA put uh, up on their website. Uh, the Council magazine uh, from the ALJ on May the 4th. So it was four days ago, I'm sorry. So how this became urgent just today, uh, in the middle of question time... Yes. No, I, didn't, I didn't quite get that injection. Feel free to ask another question uh, if you want. I, I saw this that went up four days ago. I'm not sure whether the Deputy Mayor did. Bit slack um, uh, in, in bringing this today. But this is all a political concoction to try and, on, on Federal Budget Day, um, you know, redirect people's attention, but we know what this is all about. We know that uh, this LNP administration can't manage projects, whether they are council funded or state and federal funded. Uh, we see on every single one that this Lord Mayor and his finance chair and his deputy mayor have their fingerprints on. They blow out, there's delays uh, which, which require more borrowings uh, that ratepayers have to fund or federal taxpayers have to fund. Um, so I think these are all crocodile tears. They're very deeply worried about their own budget, quite clearly, because uh, we're going to have to see uh, not, not just the highest rate take on record, but quite clearly one of the biggest rate increases on record as well, uh, to fund their stuff-ups. You know, I, I found it incredible that after seven and a half years in this job, how hollow the council budget really has become. Uh, when you see basic works, I'll go back to the Schonkoff Escarpment, because the Deputy Mayor brought that up. That's that was critical work. That is 100% a council responsibility, and this administration couldn't fund it. They couldn't fund it because all of that money is going into the inner city. It's going into the metro black hole and the Kangaroo Point Bridge black hole. This is council work they couldn't fund, so they relied on federal money to fund it, and they're coming in today because they are scared because this, this budget that's coming up is going to be a horror show for the residents of Brisbane. An absolute horror show. And if I was the Lord Mayor, I'd be worried that um, delivering that horror show uh, less than 12 months before the next election is going to reflect very, very poorly on him. Thank you. Your claim of misrepresentation, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Cassidy claimed that I let the cat out of the bag. I did absolutely no such thing. Thank you. Further speakers? God help us. Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, we can see a number of things from the motion that's been moved by the Deputy Mayor today. Six days ago, six days ago, the Australian Local Government Association put out a public statement um, about the issue that Councillor Adams has stood up and misrepresented in this chamber today as being something that was announced this morning. It is available on something called the World Wide Web six days ago. So firstly, uh, we see here the LNP cooking up a political motion simply to try and score a few cheap political points against the federal government. The same federal government that they're going cap in hand to to say, oh, but we really need your money, but oh, you're a bad federal government because you won't do what we want you to do, and boondoggle and pork barrel projects in LNP uh, wards out in the suburbs. That's what's going on here, and the chair of council is allowing it. The rules are very clear. Other people's motions are ruled out of order right. if they cannot demonstrate urgency. Yes. Now, the deputy mayor has been caught yes. out deliberately misleading the chamber. Yes. Six days ago, this was announced. It's not urgent. Point of order. She could point of, put a motion. Point of order to you, deputy mayor. Claim to be misrepresented. Uh, noted. 
Deputy Mayor stood up. She told us all it was this morning. Yes. That's when the media came out. That's when she said it happened. Because otherwise, she would have had to put her notice of motion in last week. And guess what? Six days ago, she still had four days to put the notice of motion Point in of and order. didn't do Point it. Point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. This is debate on suspension of standing orders. Relevance to the motion. Is she supporting it or not? Oh. Councillor. Councillor Johnson, if you can come. I think I'm being please. relevant to the motion. The motion is uh, that this is the most important thing we need to do today. The deputy mayor has stopped no, the, the business of council. No, we've moved she past has suspension of the standing business rule. of council to move this motion because she said it was urgent. Clearly, it's not. It's political. Now let's get to the second part of this issue, which is. This LNP administration doesn't actually have any ideas of their own. They've had to take a six-day-old press release from the Australian Local Government Association and bring it in here to try and put something up in this chamber to debate. Not an issue here today of their own to support the people of the city of Brisbane. Um, they've borrowed someone else's idea. They've tried to misrepresent it in this place and make it urgent. This LNP administration is bereft of ideas. They are fundamentally dishonest by the way they've done this today. And the other thing about all of this today is the budget is going to be handed down tonight. We know that there is a newish federal government. There are many other programs that will be announced in the budget tonight. We don't know whether funding for roads in Brisbane is coming through some other uh, avenue yes. of funding through the federal government. We don't know. It has not been publicly announced. Now, do I think that the deputy mayor is going to stand up next Tuesday and go, oh, oh, well, we got that road money, didn't we, from the budget last week, and oh, gee, it was under a different road program or it was under a different funding uh, corridor. No. She's just scoring a few cheap points here today. Uh, it's backfired because they've just been exposed as the pinching ideas from another organisation that's a week old off the internet. That's where the City of Brisbane leadership is at. Well done. Claim of misrepresentation, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I saw the media this morning, and I stand by that I saw it this Please. Councillor Johnson had no idea what I was speaking about, so I believe she probably didn't see it six days ago either. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair, and I rise in support of this motion. I would hope, Mr Chair, that this is a motion that every single councillor in this place can get in behind and support, because we are voting on whether we back the assessment of the Australian Local Government Association and its president, a Labor councillor, Labor councillor Linda Scott from Sydney, that the distribution of the additional $250 million from Canberra is unfair. What has happened is that due to an arbitrary classification of local governments across the country, no doubt developed by some Canberra bureaucrat, is that Brisbane City Council and our neighbours to the south, the City of Logan, completely miss out on a piece of this vital funding. The Gold Coast has received $3.4 million. Ipswich has received $1.3 million. Moreton Bay is getting $2.8 million. The Redlands is getting just shy of a million dollars. The Sunshine Coast is getting $2.1 million. And get this, Mr Chair, the ACT government is getting $3.8 million. Mr Chair, based on these allocations, it just doesn't make sense that Brisbane and Logan are missing out. This is not about politics. This is about ratepayers and taxpayers getting their fair share. The Albanese government has said, the government has drawn on the Australian classification of local governments as a robust framework underpinning the ter termination of eligible councils for this additional $250 million in funding. Well, Mr Chair, 
drawing on some arbitrary classification system to distribute a quarter of a billion dollars worth of funding makes no sense. It makes no sense to ALGA. It makes no sense to Labor Councillor Linda Scott. Point of and order, I Chair. hope that all councillors will support will this motion. Will Councillor Cunningham take a question? Councillor no. Cunningham, would you take a question? Oh, no. no. I'm finished. Oh. No, the answer is no. You, sorry, you're finished? Any further debate? No further debate? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Something Thank up. you, uh, Mr Chair. And uh, I am gobsmacked. We are elected into this place for one thing and one thing only, and that is to represent the people and residents of Brisbane, whether it's in your ward or whether it's across the city in a role like Deputy Mayor or Leader of the Opposition. But from those opposite, what we see is they will stick up for the locals as long as they don't have to fight their political masters. Yeah. Councillor Cuts Cassidy is quite happy to see that Brisbane doesn't get anything from the Albanese government because they've got to deal with debt and they've got to sort pork barrelling. Well, I don't know what the definition of pork barrelling is if it is not a brand new sports centre in the middle of the Treasurer, Federal and States ward, which was never announced in the Olympics or anywhere else. So he knows the definition because they use it all the time. I am so dismayed that if I heard from Councillor Griffiths Keep up with it, Councillor Adams. If they were up with it six days ago, where are their calls on their ALP federal government to advocate? I'm screaming it from the rooftops right now, councillors. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. I don't see them advocating. I don't see them talking to their federal members, saying, by the way, this is very, very, very poor. Councillor Cassidy, please. I would love to be able to pick up the phone. We have a unanimous motion moved in council to support the fact. Councillor Cassidy, please. Right now, this puts City Deal in a very, very precarious situation. I am sure the Lord Mayor and the Premier will be talking about what this means for the capital, fastest growing capital. Pot kettle black. The politics over there. We didn't even debate the motions. Both of the speakers on the other side talked about the process, talked about me, talked about hypocrisy, did not once say whether they actually truly supported or didn't support this. So what I hear is they don't truly support the residents of Brisbane. This is about Brisbane residents getting their fair share of federal funding. They pay GST too. They pay federal taxes. They deserve federal funding. Nothing more, nothing less. And shame on councillors who can't support their residents to get their fair share. Thank you. We now move to the vote on this motion that council supports the Australian Local Government Association in urgently calling for the federal government to not exclude metropolitan councils like Brisbane in the $250 million local roads and community infrastructure program phase 4B. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Second. Been called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Wines. Ayes to the right, noes to the left. Please ring the bells. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour and six abstentions. Thank you. I declare that motion carried. Councillors, please resume your seats. Thank you, councillors. Return to question time. Councillor Strunk. Hello. 
Yeah. Must be my question. I can see you, Councillor Johnson, but I've called Councillor Strunk. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of City Standards, Councillor Marks. <laughs> we see that you have uh, posted on your social media about being very busy with your arts and crafts hobby, making decorative cards. We haven't seen any progress from, from you in the um, removing of 80,000 tons of organic waste buried in landfill each year. Councillor Marks is full FOGO on the cards for Brisbane residents. Councillor Marks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, through you, Mr Chair, for the question from Councillor Strunk. Well, I'm glad to see you following my social media. It's very good. <laughs> and and, and yeah. can I... And can I can I say I hope that you are um, appreciative of the time that I spend um, generally after midnight in my crafting room making cards, birthday cards, Mother's Day cards for my residents um, to enjoy as a, as a way. No, I do not sell and take the. I'll take your injection interjection, Councillor Cumming. Councillor Cumming, please. I, 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 Councillors, please order, please. I, I do not sell any of the cards that I make. I spend uh, a fair, fair whack of the money I earn as a councillor buying supplies, and then I actually give away a whole lot of supplies to my kindies and preschools. Councillor as Johnston, please. So that's a good idea. I'll take that interjection, Councillor Wines. I will do a farewell card for Councillor Cumming. <laughs> And, and I'm thinking the design on the front is going to be a boomerang. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to find a boomer. I'm going to find a boomerang stamp just for you, Councillor Cumming, and I'm going to put it on there. So, and hopefully we'll see you again next week because we're absolutely enjoying your committee and council um, chambers interactions with us. Um, every year, I give my colleagues a Christmas card. Um, they're handmade every single year, and I know they enjoy them. Um, I also do sympathy cards. So when a resident of mine passes away, one of my job of my staff is they read the, um, condol the, the death notices every day in the paper, which is not always pleasant for my um, office to do, but they do that, and then I write a sympathy card to the remaining spouse, um, if there is one, who, if they live in my ward. Um, I also make birthday cards for residents from when they turn 80, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and even 100 when they turn 100. And do you know, the issue with the, business, the birthday cards is that the people of that age, it is so lovely, they actually take time to write me a note to thank me for the card that I sent them for their birthday, which is a very old-fashioned, I would suggest, way of doing things, but it's certainly lovely and I really, really appreciate it. Point of order, Point of order to you, Councillor Strunk. <laughs> could you bring, could you, would, you, would you bring the councillor back to the, the, the actual question, that, and that was to do with, that was to do with Fogo, something that's very important to the residents of Brisbane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Point of order, Chair, Chair. Would, you, would you perhaps... Would, would you perhaps like to actually chair this meeting, Chair? Oh. That wasn't a point of order, Councillor Cassidy. To Councillor Strunk's point of order, the uh, Councillor Marks is being relevant to the question as asked. So I'm guessing, obviously, um, the, all the, those on the opposite side are, are concerned that they're not getting birthday cards from me. So I'm more than happy, if you would like to text me your birth date, <coughs> I'm more than happy to send you a birthday card. Because I can say... I get a lot of pleasure from making cards, and they're what, my, what I would suggest is a de-stressing tool for me as a councillor. And I'd suggest if you don't have any de-stressing tools in your own um, pocket, maybe you could maybe you could take um, card making up as well. Councillor, please, of order, Mr. Chair. Councillor Strunk. Um, Point of again, order. the uh, relevancy. Um, I don't think uh, she has actually even mentioned the word FOGO, and so that was a poignant part of the question. Councillor Strunk, you asked the question. The uh, councillor is being relevant to the question as asked. And 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 also, um, I understand through you, Mr. Chair, the instructions in this chamber is that we are referred to as councillors. 
Um, as my mother always used to say, she is the dog's mother, and I'm not neither of that. Even though I have just purchased a dog, I'm actually not the dog's mother, so she is not relevant to me. So, um, well, if you want to know about the dog, I'm happy to tell you about the dog, but that's probably getting a little bit off Councillor topic. Councillor Marks, to the, that, to the question, please. That's getting off topic. I understand, Chair, that is absolutely getting off topic. Um, so, um, Councillor Strunk mentioned um, the acronym FOGO, which can I say a lot of residents don't even know what FOGO actually means, what it stands for or anything like that. So as a council, you will know that I like to speak quite plainly, so um, we spoke to officers and we came up with the terminology of food recycling. To me, that means exactly what it is. It's about food recycling and I'm very pleased to say in that space that we started a trial and unfortunately there was a little event back in 2022 um, of the floods. Councillor which... Marks, your time oh. has expired. Further questions, Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, over the weekend, our city hosted thousands of interstate visitors for the Brisbane NRL Magic Round. Can you please update the Chamber on the benefits of host hosting these major events and how it supports Brisbane's local economy? Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and it's absolutely wonderful to stand here with the Shrina administration that supports Brisbane, whether that's through infrastructure delivery, with support from other levels of government or not, or through economic support through major events. Through Council major puts in a percentage through the Brisbane Economic Development Agency in relation to how much TEQ puts through. So when tourism events in Queensland, through you, Mr Chair, I'll take the interjection from Councillor Cumming when they release their data. You can look at our data as well. Brisbane was absolutely buzzing over the weekend with the Brisbane NRL Magic Round, which just keeps getting bigger and better. There is no other time, or as we saw today in the Courier Mail, or any other city which has more sporting action packed into one magic weekend. There was an enormous colourful sea of jerseys that started about Thursday in the Queen Street Mall, line from the city to the Caxton Street, every pub, club and restaurant, and a lot of black. There's a lot of people in the Magic Round, actual black jersey as well, with the rainbow colours of all the clubs, which looked fantastic. The city was alive and it was bustling. 16 teams, eight matches right here at Suncorp. It was a frenzy of fantastic football, no matter who you barrack for, or except maybe the Storm. That didn't work too well for me on Saturday night. But the Broncos had a blinder and so did the Dolphins. Uh, but it's not just footy fans that we're chasing. It was also about cheering on our local businesses this weekend. And in a week when so much is happening in Brisbane, it was about sell-out days at the football, hotel occupancies, above 80% we saw on the weekend. 30,000 footy fans descended on Brisbane over the three-day blockbuster weekend. I should say over 30,000 from interstate. We had more than 50,000 from out of region is what we're seeing. That's an enormous amount of people driving, flying, getting into the city whatever way they can to spend their money and support our businesses as well. The malls recorded the highest foot traffic for 2023, up 60% on last year's magic round. Tens of thousand hotel beds, restaurants and pubs working around the clock. Close to $30 million injected into our local economy. And that is fantastic for not only the owners and operators, but the workers on the street, those who are looking for more jobs, even though our unemployment rate is very, very low. Everyone loves the event because everybody loves Brisbane. And who doesn't want to move out of Melbourne and Sydney for the weekend at the moment with the weather? Mind you, they must have brought a little bit with them and left it when they went back over the weekend. The energy at the stadium was absolutely electric. The stadiums were filled out. Saturday night when I was there was just madness. People lined up to see their team for the next game, cheering on the game beforehand. Um, I've never seen so many slushies as people are going through the crowd with the margarita slushies. Trays and trays. Well, there was a lot of sugar going through that crowd there as well. But we also saw doubling of last year's figures, as I said, for interstate travel. And that does well for our domestic travel and our airlines as well. It is great to see that this type of event, which is Brisbane born and bred... Councillors, please. 
take the interjection from the council lieutenants. This is the big issues. I am again standing up here to say, if you don't think $30 million injected into Brisbane's economy is a big issue, again, you have no idea how to support the residents in Brisbane who work, live and play here. People who work at Suncorp are people that live in Tennyson. They live in Callum Vale. They love the events as much as everybody else because they're getting money in their pocket. This supports Brisbane. It is a big issue. And those on the other side don't get it. They proved in the motion today they don't get it. We proved from Councillor coming over that side through you, Mr Chair, carping about the event. They don't get it. And now Councillor Johnson's upset I'm saying this because the truth hurts. We represent the people of Brisbane. We support them point of order. through infrastructure Claims delivery point of order. and to an event. Excuse me, Count, Deputy Mayor. Point Claim of order. Claim to be okay. misrepresented. We are in the middle of one of the busiest times of the year. Comedy Festival. We've just come out of the fantastic Brisbane Cycling Festival. We're coming into the Torian Pro, the biggest CrossFit event in Australia. Brisbane Street Art Festival is underway and Botanica starts at the end of this week. It is a two week long festival that hopefully people are staying and playing and paying, which puts money into the pockets of the people that live in our wards and our city. And that is a good thing. That is a great thing. And this is an event we want to see in Brisbane for years to come. Thank you. Councillor Johnson, yeah. misrepresentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Councillor Adams claimed that I was upset uh, because I didn't get it. Um, I'm upset because the Deputy Mayor thinks that the most important debate in this city is about margarita slushies. I find it embarrassing. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance and City Governance Committee, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham, major projects across Brisbane have blown out by billions of dollars and have been delayed for years. These are council projects. This morning, the Transport Committee Chair, Councillor Murphy, revealed he had no idea how much the Kangaroo Point Bridge would end up costing in the long run. These continuous blowouts are pushing up rates for every single resident. Councillor Cunningham, can you commit to end these major project blowouts and stop asking Brisbane ratepayers to pay more rates and get less services in the suburbs? Councillor Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Once again, Mr Chair, the Opposition show their naivety in coming into this place. They must live under a rock. This Schriner Council has guided the city through a health crisis. We have guided our city through a flood crisis. And we are guiding our city through a global inflation crisis. Because of years of careful financial management, because we have ignored the opposition's calls to go into debt. Councillor Johnston, please, I've been pretty patient with you, but please stop interjecting. <laughs> Mr Chair, we have guided our city through uncertain times. We've been able to respond to the changing circumstances. It doesn't mean it's easy, Mr Chair, but difficult decisions have had to be made. We're doing the right thing by the ratepayers of Brisbane and they trust this Lord Mayor to manage Council's $4 billion budget. Times are tough. You only need to ask the state Labor government. The Coomera Connector project had an escalation of over $600 million. Cross River Rail has not been immune either. In fact, the CRR Delivery Authority CEO said just not long ago, over the last 12 months, we have seen impacts in the construction sector right across the board as far as escalation goes. We've also had the flood and we've seen supply chain impacts from the likes of the war in the Ukraine. These are his words, Mr Chair. Clearly, there is an issue right across the economy. Bulk water prices have increased nearly 15% in the past four years. Bitumen up 50%. Building construction costs in Queensland have increased 14% in the past year. 
fuel 37% in the 12 months. Times are tough for governments delivering projects, just like they're tough for the residents of Brisbane managing their own expenses. If those opposite want to play politics when it comes to infrastructure delivery, that's fine, but we'll get on with the job of delivering the services and the projects that our city deserves. When it comes to the council budget going forward, residents can trust the Schriner Council to manage and to make the responsible decisions that are required as Australia's largest local government. We had our strong credit rating reaffirmed by the QTC last year. Those opposite can fling mud as much as they like, Mr Chair, but we are doing the hard work to manage the impacts of the current economic climate, just like we had to during the pandemic and just like we did during the flood crisis, Mr Chair. What we will not do is raise our rates by over 6% like the Labor Party did the last time they were in this place. Not once, Mr Chair, not once, but four times. And they didn't build anything either. They didn't build a thing. That is the, that is the Labor way, Mr Chair. That is not the LNP way. And we are making the hard financial decisions that are required. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Davis. Councillor Davis, the flood buyback scheme that the federal and state governments adopted from the Brisbane City Council continues to be rolled out successfully. Can you please update the Chamber on the latest in this program, including the flow on benefits for our local communities? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, I'd like to thank Councillor Atwood uh, for the question. Uh, Mr Chair, last month marked a significant milestone in our delivery of the voluntary home buyback program. I'm very pleased to report that the first demolitions commenced in Rockley and Oxley on five properties purchased under the scheme. And this is just the beginning. There are already 78 properties which have settled now and are in council hands. And just last week, we received a further tranche of 144 properties from the state government, which brings the total to over 350. As properties settle, they will be added to a rolling program of demolition and removal. Mr Chair, we are delivering the program with a sustainability focus. Wherever possible, we will look for opportunities to relocate the building or repurpose and recycle materials, which will save tonnes of construction waste from landfill. In total, we will see more than 15 hectares added to Brisbane's green, state, uh, green space estate as these flood prone blocks become re-turfed and revegetated as public parkland, natural reserves and waterway corridors. In some areas, residents will benefit from a new pocket part, park in their street, which will double as space for water during flooding events, reducing the risk to neighbouring properties. Uh, in, um, in other areas, low on the floodplain, like Rockley, the green space estate will expand considerably and allow more space for water to flow, uh, to soak and spread, with benefits uh, right across the catchment. But most important is the human impact of this program. We know that the decision to sell your home is never an easy one, and for many, it's an option of last resort. And that's why we've taken great steps to ensure that this program is delivered with empathy uh, and compassion and we can secure really great outcomes for homeowners. Because, Mr Chair, it is our policy to purchase homes for their pre-flood value. And for many families, this can make the world of difference when it comes to finding another home outside the path of floodwaters. Of course it is and has always been a purely voluntary program and a small number of people have declined to proceed with buyback and that's okay. Our officers in the land acquisition team have done a spectacular job in working through this process with homeowners. And I'd like to take a few moments to share some feedback from residents involved in the program. 
One family in Windsor wrote Councillor Wines, we are overjoyed with the outcome, now being able to turn the page and move on, and it wouldn't have happened without you and your team's dedication. Getting flooded was an awfully stressful thing, but with you and council support, it has helped us work through it and manage it okay. Another homeowner in Rockley uh, said, you have closed what has been a very trying chapter in our lives, and we will always remember the kindness and compassion you showed us. And from Corinda, a couple shared with us, we cannot thank you enough for your support with every aspect of the buyback. Your empathy and support will never be forgotten. Mr Chair, there are many more examples uh, than this, and I'd like to join the residents in thanking the land acquisition team for their dedication and for their compassion in delivering this important program. Mr Chair, Councillor Atwood reminds of an important point that it was only through the many years of work in successfully developing our voluntary home purchase scheme that we were able to secure these outcomes on behalf of the state and federal governments. After the 2022 flood event, in uh, which more than 23,000 properties were impacted, we knew that a new buyback scheme uh, would be required and that this time we would need significant investment uh, from other levels of government to deliver it. So the Lord Mayor took the initiative and wrote to the state and federal governments to seek their support in funding an expanded buyback program to get more properties and more people out of harm's way. And through the Lord Mayor's advocacy, $741 million was secured for the Resilient Homes Fund, which is now facilitated by the QRA. When the time came to get the Resilient Homes Fund up and running, we already had an exemplar template which was developed for our own voluntary home purchase scheme. And this became the model for the current program that's being rolled out not only in Brisbane, but right across the state. Mr Chair, the Srinna Council is rolling the biggest buyback program uh, in our history and our team will continue to work with residents whose homes have been identified Thank for you. buyback. Thank you. Councillor Davis, your time has expired. Uh, point of Council order. Councillor Griffiths. Yes, point of order. Mr Chair, can I just check with the notice of motion, I moved the motion in relation to the voluntary home buyback scheme. Is that still on the table? The answer is yes. 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 Uh, then, uh, Mr Chair, I would request that, given uh, the answer we've just heard from Councillor Davis, that we uh, uh, now bring that motion back to the chamber and debate that motion. Seconded. Okay. So, if I'm reading this correctly... Okay. So, yeah, but it's this one, yeah? Thank you, Councillor Johnston. So the motion uh, submitted by Councillor Griffiths on the meeting of 28th of March uh, was in relation to that you move that the Lord Mayor reinstates the council funding for the voluntary flood affected homes buyback scheme in the 23-24 Brisbane City Council budget. And if um, so, the motion that you're moving is that we resume that debate. Yeah. Okay. So that's the debate before us now. Is that that debate? gets resumed. Vote vote. Yes, that's right, that the vote is resumed. All in favour of that debate being resumed, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. The floor is yours, Councillor Griffiths. I just need to find out where we were in the point of that debate. <laughs> I think the LMP, we got to the end of the meeting and the LMP moved that lay on the table. Oh. Um, uh, look, this is a no-brainer, and just hearing Councillor Davies, uh, Davis then... Point of order, Chair. Oh, point of order to you, oh, Councillor Mr Landis. Chair, as per section 42 2B of the meeting's Local Law 2001, uh, I move a procedural motion that the debate uh, on the motion now move uh, to the end of the business of today's agenda. Second. Thank you. We have a procedural motion that this motion, uh, this debate be moved to later in today's agenda, at the end of today's meeting. All in favour of that procedural motion, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson. Seconded. And Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. Eyes to the right, nose to the left. Please read the result. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour and 7 against. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Friday 28th of April 2023 be adopted. Seconded. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Well, it's been an uh, interesting meeting already. We've seen some extraordinary things happen. Uh, we've seen uh, Councillor Cassidy and the Labor councillors have a conversion on the road to Damascus. Yes. They are concerned about debt now. Yes. Would you believe? Yes. They are suddenly concerned about debt. They are... <laughs> so, and so, um, they, they, but basically what happened was Councillor Cassidy justified federal cuts to Brisbane City Council because he was suddenly concerned about debt. This is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. This is, this is the councillor and the party that has a record of always opposing cuts and never opposing debt. And then suddenly they've reversed their position entirely. And Let's have a little reminder about the status of debt. Now, Brisbane City Council uh, today has a debt per capita of just over $2,000 per person. So the per capita debt is $2,000 per person. The Queensland government, the Queensland... Councillor Strunk. The Queensland government debt, the equivalent measure, is over 20,000 per person. Not, not 2,000, 20,000. And they're suddenly concerned about debt. Have you ever heard Labor councillors be concerned about state government Labor debt? Never. And now suddenly they've received the talking points from the Labor Treasurer's office and they're like, oh, we're concerned about debt. <laughs> It's extraordinary. But then other things that are really interesting happened in this meeting as well. They decided to personally make fun of one of our hardest working councillors because she takes the time to make cards for people. Like, seriously? Why don't you highlight one of the things that makes her one of the most popular councillors in this place and rub that ink spot? Because making fun of Councillor Marx, you're making fun of someone who cares deeply about our community, works really hard, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone question Councillor Marx's work ethic. No. 
uh, and then highlight the fact that she goes above and beyond in her own spare time with her own money to make personal cards for people. Yeah. She starts at the beginning of the year making Christmas cards. Uh, she really puts a lot of love and effort into it and Labor councillors want to make fun of that. Yeah. Well done, well done. And then Councillor Griffiths forgot that he had a motion on the table. He had to actually ask the question, oh, is that motion still on the table? He cares so passionately about this issue that he forgot about it. And now today he'll concoct some kind of fury about how he's suddenly so hot on this issue, the one that he forgot about. Now that his pre-selection's over, <laughs> he's actually interested in it again because he had a little bit of a battle on his hands, I understand. Uh, many people in the party wanted to kick him out for being so ineffective over such a long period of time and he's managed to scrape through and now he remembered he had a party political motion on the table. So we look forward to what he has to say about that uh, now that he's actually remembered that he moved a motion on this issue. Uh, what's happened today really says a lot about a lot of things. It highlights an opposition that is only interested in party politics. Not in the slightest bit interested in the people of Brisbane. Not in the slightest bit interested that we are the fastest growing capital city in Australia. Not in the slightest bit interested uh, that every week people are coming here from other parts of Australia and the world and we need better infrastructure, we need more investment from all levels of government, yet they were quite happy to abstain on a vote calling for Brisbane residents to get their fair share of federal funding. Right. Party politics all the way for these people. Party politics all the way for Labor councillors. They will never, they will never attack their Labor colleagues. Even if it's the right thing to do. Now, our record stands in clear contrast to that. Now, I will point out that when, during the short period of time, we had a LNP state government, we went into a massive fight with that government about the bus network review. And in fact, there are still people who are angry with us in the state team about that bus network review. I won't mention any names. We did the right thing by our people of Brisbane to support them even if it was our party. We stood up and we did the right thing. Labor would never do that. They will, they will fall into line, they will toe the party line, and they will always put their party first above the people of Brisbane. This is the opposition who claims that they want to be the next administration. And what that would mean if that happened, it would be a Labor-Green administration that wouldn't be prepared to stand up for the people of Brisbane, that wouldn't support more funding for roads because the Greens would be pulling the string, that would support less funding for roads, they would want to defund the police, uh, they would support people in shoplifting if they didn't have enough money, they would support people in illegally squatting in houses. The list goes on. Um, but one thing they certainly wouldn't do is they would never stand up and fight for the fair share for the people of Brisbane. Now, why is this more important now than ever before? You just have to look at the uh, statistics on growth. In the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics growth figures for uh, the different regions and cities of Australia, Sydney grew by 0.7%. Melbourne grew by 1.1%, Adelaide grew by 1.1%, Perth grew by 1.5%, Hobart grew by 0.7%, by Darwin by 0.5%, Canberra by 0.7% and regional Australia grew by 1.2%. But what did Brisbane grow by? 2.3%. And as was pointed out by one of my colleagues earlier, uh, we're growing three times as fast as Sydney and twice as fast as Melbourne. Yet Labor councillors abstained when it came to asking for a fair share of federal funds. And one of my colleagues also pointed out that more than 90 per cent, I think it's 93 per cent of all tax revenue 
is levied by other levels of government other than 97. local government. 97 percent. And so 3 percent of tax revenue uh, across this nation is levied by local government, 97 by the other two, and I think it's more than 81 percent by the federal government. Yet Labor councillors think it's okay to not demand our fair share from the level of government that collects the most tax. It is right that they fairly fund all councils and not for some political reason exclude some councils. And the Deputy Mayor pointed out that in the lead up to the last election when the Albanese opposition at the time said, yeah, we'll support LRCI, we'll add an extra 250 million. That was a relief to all of us. That was a relief to all of us because we took them at their word and wouldn't you believe, the devil's in the detail. Absolutely. Once the election's over, they scraped in with no policy agenda to speak of and now they've revealed that certain councils are going to miss out on this funding, despite promising big to every council that they would benefit in a share of $250 million. But don't expect Labor councillors to stand up and fight. It is quite extraordinary, uh, but as I said, uh, it says a lot. Mr Chair, uh, as I always do, I wanted to acknowledge some of the great community causes um, that we support as an organisation, uh, particularly through the lighting up of assets across the city. Uh, last night, the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge and Redica Place were lit up in teal to support, teal, um, to support World Ovarian Cancer Day. Uh, this day raises awareness about this type of cancer, which is the eighth mo most common cancer in Australia. About 1,700 Australian women are diagnosed each year with this disease. Uh, tonight, the Tropical Dome, uh, the Story Bridge, uh, will both be lit up in red to support World Red Cross and World Red Crescent Day. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Move for an extension, seconded. We have a motion for an extension of time for the Lord Mayor, moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Landers. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. Lord Mayor. Uh, World Red Crescent Day, uh, celebrated on the 8th of May each year uh, and celebrates the unity of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. Tonight, the Victoria Bridge and Radcliffe Place will be lit up in blue to support uh, International uh, Thala Sesamia Day. Uh, this International Day raises awareness about the struggles of people who have this severe blood disease, including remembering those who unfortunately have passed away from the disease as well. Uh, tomorrow night, City Hall, Redcliffe Place, Victoria Bridge and the Story Bridge will be led up in yellow to support the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Uh, this year, the festival celebrates 61 years. Uh, it also involves thousands of readers and writers to showcase their uh, literature and celebrate their stories. Thursday Eve is, uh, is the eve of Do It For Dolly Day, and this annual day is dedicated to bringing the community together, spreading kindness and uniting all people in standing up against bullying. On Friday night, our assets will be lit in blue to support uh, those who suffer from chronic fatigue. Uh, this Awareness Week is observed all around the world to demonstrate how this debilitating disease can uh, affect its sufferers. On Saturday night, the Victoria Bridge, Radcliffe Place and Story Bridge will be lit up in yellow for the Brisbane Art Design Festival, otherwise known as BAD, uh, but it is anything but BAD. Uh, it's an amazing uh, art design festival that uh, we support each year. Uh, it shows the incredible uh, talent that our city has and its designers have. Finally, on Sunday night, all of our assets will be lit up in yellow uh, to support National Road Safety Week. It's great to uh, join uh, councillors, uh, a number of councillors at the uh, Lanham Park Mayfair on the weekend. Um, councillors Hammond, Wines and Davis were there, together with uh, David Crisofoli, the Leader of the Opposition. It's great to see so many people out uh, enjoying uh, that event. Uh, perfect weather for it. Um, and I want to thank Councillor Hammond and the Inner North Rotary Club of Brisbane for organising this event, as well as all of the uh, sponsors and supporters and stallholders that uh, came along. Uh, also, uh, I want to acknowledge the uh, Vasaki event um, uh, put on by the Punjabi Cultural Association. 
uh, at Curlew Park in Sandgate, and Councillor Cassidy, uh, who was the uh, local councillor there, and also uh, the presiding officer for a citizenship ceremony. It was a fantastic event and uh, enjoyed by all, and it's always great to see uh, our newest citizens welcomed into the family. Uh, I did want to point out, uh, and it is timely to point out, and uh, you know, something which makes an impact around the world that is hard to um, overstate, and that is uh, the locally produced TV show, Louis, uh, that now celebrated um, becoming the most streamed show in the US with 737 million minutes of Bluey having been viewed. And uh, I say it's hard to overstate because what you're seeing is uh, in homes around the world, a very unique view of Brisbane being portrayed uh, to children and I've got to say to parents as well around the world that really showcases this amazing city we've got. We know that Bluey takes real locations and works them in to their animations. Uh, we know that um, places in particular in Council Maddox Ward feature heavily, but also the Brisbane City Cats, the Brisbane City Council buses, uh, and the, a whole range of features about our city uh, as well. And so having that broadcast around the world and watched by so many people uh, really um, has an amazing impact because we know that more and more people will want to learn about Brisbane and come and visit Brisbane. And we know also uh, previous examples where these kind of things can generate a, a tourism economy of their own. Uh, remember the Lord of the Rings um, series and that generated massive tourism inflow into New Zealand. Um, and I have no doubt a similar thing will gear up in Brisbane as well. Um, and uh, I have every expectation that there will be uh, people offering bluey tours of Brisbane uh, and uh, showing the sights that appear um, in that show. Uh, and that is a good thing. It's something we should celebrate. The other thing that I love about it is uh, it celebrates the unique Queenslanders that we've all worked really hard to protect. And so this very unique form of housing um, that you won't see anywhere else in the world um, is showcased around the world, the Queenslander uh, style home. And so it's really wonderful. It also points out how leafy and green Brisbane is as well uh, and highlights why we were awarded the, uh, the, the gig as Australia's greenest capital city uh, in, I think it was last year when we got that award. So uh, we should celebrate uh, the impact that Bluey has. Uh, there will be more and more kids around the world eating Vegemite saying the word dunny instead of toilet um, and wanting to come and visit Brisbane and we welcome them. The uh, item on the agenda today is the Stores Board submission significant contracting plan for the cartage of quarry products. Uh, obviously uh, not a particularly sexy item but one that is important. Uh, Council owns and operates two quarries, one at Mount Cutha and also at Bracalba. Uh, both of which are critical to the production of asphalt for Council's road network. Now, uh, having those two quarries um, shows uh, significant foresight in the past uh, because there are many, many councils that do not have their own quarries uh, and they have to rely on others for the supply of this material. So having this ability to supply our own materials is, is something that adds significant value to the people of Brisbane. Uh, and they may not realise it, but uh, it does help keep the costs down as well in terms of providing that material for things like road resurfacing and, and various other uses as well. Uh, this, uh, this current, the, currently the cartridge services contract is a preferred supplier arrangement that expires on the 30th of November this year. Uh, the demand for asphalt material has increased significantly in recent years. And it's not just about road resurfacing, but also uh, major projects that are underway, uh, whether it's Brisbane Metro or uh, Beams Road upgrade or Mogul Road Corridor upgrade and a range of other projects that rely on uh, quarry material. Uh, going to market for these services will provide Council more options when it comes to transport, 
allowing a wider variety of support outside those we currently have to contract the work with. So this tender will go out to a competitive market basis on the 15th of May. Uh, it will close a month uh, within a month. Uh, the panel arrangement will be then decided for a maximum term of up to five years. So uh, pretty straightforward, and I do hope councillors support this item. Thank you. Further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I to speak on um, all the items on ENC. Oh, that's right, there's only one. Uh, as we reflect on the work that this LNP Mayor is doing uh, the last two weeks, uh, we've had a grand total of two items come to Council. Um, last week was privatising a uh, portion of a bridge um, um, to allow a fancy restaurant, uh, and this week it's contracting out um, basic services, the cartage of quarry projects to the private sector. Um, you know, there's, there's no discussion. You know, apparent, apparently, the Lord Mayor was all too busy in this meeting to be able to, to debate Councillor Griffith's motion um, about reinstating an important... He didn't want to be here for that. Couldn't talk about that, but he spent a lot of time talking about Bluey. Great show. Didn't talk about the central messages of um, care and compassion. Um, talked about uh, Bluey tours. and We used to have them. There used to be one down at, um, at Norman Park, but he cut that ferry as well, uh, this Lord Mayor. Um, there are so many things we should be talking about, Chair, uh, in this council meeting today. He didn't talk about housing. Uh, he didn't talk about local road congestion. Um, or, uh, yeah, he didn't talk about, he didn't talk about flood proofing Councilor Brisbane. Councillor Cassidy didn't uh, talk about any of these change. things either. Yeah. So, sorry, Lord Mayor, are you taking a point of order? Or just didn't claim to be misrepresented. Hey, okay, thank you. But it didn't, yeah, he won't, they refused to talk about organic recycling, food organics, garden organics recycling, to remove 80,000 tonnes of organic material from our landfill each and every year. They don't want to talk about that. They won't talk about those critical issues uh, for the future of Brisbane. All, all this LNP administration wants to talk about today is a significant contracting plan for the cartage of quarry products. This is, this is, I heard an interjection when the Lord Mayor was talking before, I think it was Councillor Marks, I'm sure she can correct me if I'm wrong, which said it's essential or necessary, said it's necessary work. And I agree. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's, it's necessary and it's basic. Uh, basic council work, since its inception, this council, a um, hundred years ago, has been responsible for road maintenance um, and quarry products are a key part of that, obviously. Um, if we look at um, item nine in the report that's before us today, it raises an important question which is included in all these significant contracting plans, and that question is, could council businesses provide the services or works? Now, what we've um, uh, become accustomed to in reading these reports generally is that that says no. It usually says no, council can't do these services anymore because of the hollowing out and the contracting out of this conservative LNP ideology which has been uh, here in this uh, council and the Lord Mayor's office for the last 20 years. But this one's slightly different and, and I was encouraged to see that council could do these services but then as you read on they choose not to, they choose to contract it out. Um, so council could do these basic works in-house and give secure um, stable employment uh, in an ongoing way um, to workers here in Brisbane, um, but the council says in this report uh, they could do this but they don't have the capacity to do it anymore. So it's something council could do if the LNP chose to, but currently there is no capacity to do so because this LNP administration led by Adrian Schrinner has hollowed out council's workforce and they can no longer do the basics. You wonder, well, you don't wonder anymore after 20 years of LNP rule in this place, why council is going like this. We heard from Councillor Cunningham before that the, the LNP apparently responded to the floods last year. They didn't have enough people to fill sandbags, didn't have enough people to close roads. Um, they, they didn't have enough people um, to be able to respond on the ground. Uh, and, and in the weeks after, we're, we're relying on labour hire companies to provide staff. Um, and contractors, other external contractors, getting tree trimming contractors to come in, stop doing that work on that contract to come in because there's no ongoing work in council. Uh, hence why these types of basic works have to, um, have to uh, be contracted out. So um, perhaps um, what they mean in terms of capacity um, is actually money, is really what they're talking about. Um, I suspect internally, and, and they've, got, they've got their... Um, you know, their key lines and they can go to their, their blue folders and pull out the sheet when they get a question on rates or budget management. Um, uh, and they can read that out. Uh, 
but that's what that means. There's no, there is no resourcing put into the capacity of council to deliver basic services anymore, and we're in, we're in this now um, uh, vicious cycle where basic work needs to be contracted out uh, and then they need to engage contractors to manage those contracts in, in contracting out that basic work. And there is no value for money equation anymore in that. But there's nothing, there's nothing that this council can do about it uh, because there is no capacity. So we go full circle around. So 20 years goes by, all this contracting goes, uh, goes on and goes on and goes on. And even if you wanted to make a change, uh, you look at the budget bottom line and you go, well, there's no capacity to do so. Um, it's the default position of this LNP administration. You look at it, grass cutting, tree pruning, concept design and engineering services, manufacturing of buses, pathway upgrades, drainage restoration works, hydraulic fire systems, hall refurbishments, supply and delivery of pipes and culverts, roof replacements, and that's just since the start of this year. Just since the start of this year, Chair. So obviously um, we have no problem with the individual businesses that will tender for this work. Um, that's in their interest to do it, obviously, to make money out of these tenders. They wouldn't do it otherwise. That's the, you know, the very purpose of running these businesses, is to make a profit f for an individual or for shareholders or whatever. Um, but there is a serious problem with the ease that this LNP mayor and LNP administration are happy to contract out services, uh, basic works and, importantly, jobs. Um, we know that uh, at the quarries that these, um, uh, these trucks will be going to and picking up, uh, there is now a situation where there are permanent employees uh, working directly for council there, working alongside labour hire employees who get employed on a day to day basis. They get called up and said, yeah, we'll have you in tomorrow, or no, we don't need you tomorrow. It's ongoing work, but we know it's a strategy that this LMP is employing throughout council to divide and conquer and de-unionise a workforce, because then they become more pliable uh, to the LMP's way of thinking. Um, you know, that paints a very clear picture uh, about how this LMP administration is exactly the same as their political friends at the state government and at the federal government who got tossed out last year. Um, I suppose there's little reason why the Courier-Mail described Adrian Schrinner as a uh, conservative, uh, a strong conservative voice. That's what they said within the LNP is a strong conservative voice. Uh, th these contracts prove that uh, day in, day out in this council. Uh, you don't need to look any further than that. So when a contract comes through like this that says that this council could, if there was a political will in here, engage these services directly and provide that, that uh, basic service to the residents of Brisbane, give them good value for money and also provide secure employment. Uh, we won't be supporting the contracting out of those jobs. Uh, we will never support the contracting out of those jobs and, in fact, there should be a wholesale review of everything the Council does uh, in delivering basic services to actually look at that value for money because you can, you, can, you can just say it by saying, and I'm sure the Lord Mayor will when this contract comes back to Council, well, this contractor was the cheapest, therefore it is value for money. Uh, but there is no assessment done about the true return to the community on their rates uh, when you deliver these basic services in-house. So, no, we won't be supporting this item today. Thank you. Further speakers? Point oh, order. sorry. Yes. Lord Mayor, claim, uh, the claim to be misrepresented. Uh, Councillor Cassidy listed a number of issues that he criticised me for not talking about yet we've just been through question time where they didn't ask me a single question on any of those issues. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Marks? Councillor Marks? Point of order. Sorry. Apologies. Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Um, I'm just seeking a ruling on whether that was actually a point of misrepresentation by the Lord Mayor. He was just debating essentially what um, Councillor Cassidy had to say. So I'm not sure how that was misrepresentation. Is it your ruling that it was? Yes, I believe the Law Mayor responded to the uh, issue that was raised and uh, made his point of misrepresentation. Thank you. So just to be clear, you can now debate. Councillor Johnson, I'm not debating points of order processes. I'm just with trying you. to clarify what the rule is the, here. Councillor Johnson, I'm not debating with you points of order. Councillor Marks. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on item A, which is the Stores Board submission for the cartage of quarry goods. So this SCP seeks to establish a corporate procurement arrangement in the form of a panel arrangement, which will expand the cap cap capability sorry, and capacity of materials to be transported between Brisbane's production facilities across Brisbane. These facilities, such as the two quarries at Mount Cutha and Brakelba, form a component of the supply chain for the production of asphalt materials for Council's road maintenance program that ensures Brisbane's are able to get home sooner and safer. So for those who are new to the Chamber, I'm happy to give some background. So Council owns and operates two quarries. Um, one at Mount Cutha and one at Brakalba, and a construction materials recycling staging facility at Pine Mountain. So the management and administration of the Brakalba quarry is separate to the combined management and administration of the facilities at Mount Cutha quarry and Pine Mountain. These facilities form a critical component of the supply chain for the production of the asphalt materials for our road making rehabilitation as well as for servicing external commercial contracts from Bacalba Quarry. So the cartage of this quarry products contract encompasses the transport of gravel and other construction materials from our quarries to the asphalt plants at Eagle Farm and Riverview as well as from Bacalba to service commercial contracts. So the transporting of recycled construction material to Pine Mountain for processing is also included. So in short, we do a lot of transporting of stuff around the city, um, and obviously Bacalba, which is outside of the city grounds. So um, I just want to say that the, um, it's a significant contract, and we're obviously seeking approval for a public tender to establish a panel of suppliers for this service. Um, and as I've mentioned, the critical parts of this is about the processing of the transportation of various asphalt products across our city and further out to um, uh, Bacalba, which is outside of our city edges. Um, and look, I'm just happy to say that I'm very proud of our administration's investment in finding solutions to increasing our recycled materials and asphalt, including the asphalt removed during road resurfacing projects. Um, I personally have been out to a site where we do store at Pine Mountain the recycled concrete, so concrete footpaths that are, that are picked up um, for repairing and replacement. They go back to Pine Mountain and I've been out there where there's been a huge mountain, no pun intended, of concrete. Um, and then on the secondary visit I've been out there and it's all been used up. So I think that can be only a good thing for us and the residents and it's disappointing to hear that those in the opposition will not be supporting this. Thank you very much. Is there any further debate? No further debate. Now move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Division. called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. Please ring the bells. Eyes to the right, nose to the left. Thanks, Ashley. Please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 16 in favour and 7 against. Thank you. Motion is carried. Councillors, resume your seats. Deputy Mayor, Economic, and Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move the report of the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 2nd of May 2023 be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting dated Tuesday 2nd of May 2023 be adopted. Deputy Mayor. 
Sorry. Thank you, Mr Chair. Before I go to the report from last week, I just want to remind people we have been on a break, uh, but that is no reason to, rem to forget that the Business Hub is still there and supporting our small to medium businesses. Coming up this week, from tomorrow through to next Tuesday, how to take your event from ideas to launch. That's tomorrow morning at 9.30. Winning government business, the 2032 Olympic opportunity for Queensland business, which will be on the 16th at 9am, being held by GovReady, and they do a fantastic job on getting businesses ready, on getting onto panels and supporting them for Brisbane, for council, state and um, federal uh, grants as well. We received some fantastic feedback in the last few weeks. Um, the Art of Public Speaking uh, had a great event for free and they said thank you for organising that. Um, a great session around practical, applic applicable, collaborative learning built in. And that was the secrets to report building through the sales cycle. Um, there was an on the couch with Lord Mayor and Lady Mayor Srinna over the break, which was apparently a fantastic <coughs> and inspiring event. Um, I was here launching APCS. It was a big night in Brisbane, I can assure you. And and uh, the Business Hub really is a gem for small business, so please keep it alive. So we're getting that feedback from so many, and I assure you we will be keeping it alive and, in, and making sure that we spread the word. I ask all councillors to please spread the word to their businesses to make sure they know what is on. Um, speaking of the Business Hub and how we support, as I have been today, our local residents and businesses, last week we got our start of session economic update. The ABS recently released the annual regional population report detailing population changes over the 2023 financial year, showing continued growth in our net internal migration to Greater Brisbane, with just over 28,000 people moving into the region, the region in the last 12 months. <coughs> We've covered unemployment figures, which are reported to be the lowest in nearly 15 years um, at just 3.2 per cent has not been that low since 2009. Youth unemployment rate is down to 6.5 per cent, which has been generally above 10 since 2010, so that is fantastic as well. The number of job seekers has uh, fallen well below pre-COVID levels, and it's just the small business in Brisbane is showing signs of that strengthening, with a 5 per cent increase in registered small businesses over the last 12 months. That is 5,500 new small businesses in Brisbane. So they are now 97 per cent of businesses in Brisbane, a sign of confidence in our local economy. And let's remember, who runs small businesses? Mums and dads and residents that live in our wards. So we are absolutely proud of supporting our local economy and proving once again that we are the most small business friendly council in Australia and we support all across Brisbane as well. Domestic and international travel is rising. Um, international has a little way to go yet, but domestic is up over pre-COVID levels, about 104 per cent, which is great to see as well. And on average, travellers are spending more, which is also great for that hip pocket for our local businesses and workers as well. The foot traffic through the mall is getting strong and, as we said, we saw a 60 per cent increase on last year's foot traffic uh, in the Queen Street Mall from Magic Ground and look forward to seeing what that month-on-month -month change is as well for the Queen Street Mall. I recommend the report to the Chamber. Thank you. Is there any debate? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on the economic update. The update tells a clear story about the challenges we, as a city, have faced over what has been some of the toughest years in our history. The data acknowledges that despite these challenges, our city has awoken from its COVID cocoon and is well positioned to continue to grow and thrive in the post-pandemic world. Unsurprisingly, as the Deputy Mayor shared, we know that our southern friends have begun to recognise that Brisbane is alive with opportunity, soon to be the host to the Olympic and Paralympic Games and home to an idyllic climate that we know and love. Over the past 12 months, we've seen more than 28,000 residents moving from Sydney and Melbourne, acknowledging Brisbane as the fastest growing capital city in Australia. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistic data, the unemployment rate in Brisbane peaked in May 2020 at the height of the pandemic, with more than 64,000 locals on job seeker payments. However, the unemployment rate has since decreased to 3.2 per cent, with 26,000 people on these payments as of April 2023, lower than pre-pandemic levels. Unfortunately, this has presented its own challenges, with many businesses struggle, struggling to fill vacancies. The number of advertised jobs reported through the online platforms such as Seek, Career One, and Australian Job Search demonstrated strong growth 
through the months of October 2022 to just reach over 35,000 new jobs listed in this month. It has been the highest in over a decade. This, it, this not only places greater emphasis on skills, training and development of workers to fill vacant jobs, but also increases pressure on businesses investing in staff training and retaining staff in an extremely competitive market. Our Brisbane hub and suburban Brisbane hub, business hub sorry, at Nunda continues to be the lifeline for so many small businesses, providing training, support, mentoring, networking, all for free. Since 2020, we've had more than 24,000 businesses provide, be, receive support through these hubs in the, in, since 2020. In terms of business activity, there has been a significant increase in the number of new businesses starting up in Brisbane. According to the statistics again, there were more than 136,000 active trading businesses in Brisbane, which represented a net increase of approximately 5,600 businesses since last year. This suggests that our support programs for entrepreneurs and small businesses has been effective in promoting economic growth and job creation. As Australia's Small Business Friendly Council, we are proud of the many initiatives we have developed and continue to deliver across Brisbane. Initiatives like our Growing Precincts Together program, which supports retail precincts across the city improve their local economic prosperity. And, of course, our Small Business Roundtable, which sees industry and business leaders provide feedback and insight on what is happening in their industry, while helping us shape council programs and, program and projects. The tourism hospitality sector was one of the hardest hit during our pandemic, with many businesses forced to close or reduce operations due to lockdowns or travel restrictions. However, according to the data, Brisbane's tourism industry has been showing signs of great recovery. In the first quarter of 2023, the number of domestic visitors to Brisbane increased by 25 per cent compared with the same period in 2020. This suggests that the Council initiatives aimed at supporting the tourism and hospitality sector, such as our targeted marketing campaigns and promotions via the Brisbane app, or investments in things like Brisbane's Magic Round, have been effective in attracting visitors to our city. Overall, while the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on Brisbane's economy, our Shrina Council initiatives to support local businesses and to stimulate activity have been effective in mitigating negative impacts. As a result, the city continues to grow and thrive in this, in this post-pandemic world, and I want to put on record my appreciation to the team for their efforts for continuing to support our local economy. Thank you. Further debate? No further debate. Deputy Mayor. Now move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. We have a, move, a motion for an afternoon tea adjournment moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Murphy, Transport Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I move that the report of the Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of May 2023, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Murphy and seconded by Councillor Huang that the report of the Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 2nd of May 2023, be adopted. Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Last week, members of the Transport Committee received a presentation on uh, our Brisbane Metro Accessibility Working Group. This is a group that was formed in 2019 and it meets quarterly to discuss how Council can ensure uh, that the project makes Brisbane's public transport system accessible for everyone. They've met around 30 times since their inception and members represent groups with interest in mobility, uh, disability services, access, aged, uh, hearing and vision impaired. The group provides an interactive forum for members to provide uh, comments and to shape various aspects of the Metro project. Their feedback has covered everything from design uh, and operation of vehicle to layout of the infrastructure upgrades, so that is the station upgrades. 
The Accessibility Working Group also provides valuable insights into how we might make the overall customer journey and experience as accessible and inclusive as possible through onboard and on-platform systems, through uh, wayfinding uh, and signage as well. The Working Group has participated in several exercises to inform the layout of uh, the Metro. Throughout the vehicle design stage, uh, we have utilised life-size mock-ups and taped floor tests to generate feedback even before the vehicle was manufactured, Chair. That feedback has played a uh, very significant role in shaping uh, the Metro itself. More than 35 major design changes were made uh, to the vehicle layout as a direct outcome of our engagement with the Accessibility Working Group. And based on the group's feedback, uh, we did things like relocated uh, the first door to make way for an additional mobility space. Uh, that means there'll be three uh, wheelchair bays in the front compartment. We also increased the size of the mobility allocated spaces to be above the minimum uh, disability standards for accessible public transport requirements. The number of priority seats we've been able to increase from two to ten. Uh, and we have maximised the number of alternative passenger assistance buttons, including bell push buttons, uh, ramp request buttons, uh, and open door buttons. Once the vehicle commenced testing, Chair, we also had a working group on board several times to provide further feedback on the uh, pilot vehicle. This has resulted in further uh, adjustments to the vehicle, including the automated vehicle ramp, which will be rolled out to the rest of the fleet. The working group has also assisted with design improvements to infrastructure at the Cultural Centre station uh, and the Buranda Busway station. We worked very hard in our, uh, I won't say design, but the redesign uh, of these stations to make them more accessible than they already were. At Cultural Centre station, for example, the layout of the stop will make it much easier to get on and off the platform and the relocation of the lift wells will increase accessibility. But the feedback from our accessibility working group gave us additional insights into the location of help points uh, and signage at the stops, which makes sure everyone can get around those stations as easily as possible. These improvements will ensure equitable access for all patrons, uh, not only once works are completed, but as we progress through the construction phase as well. Feedback collected by the working group will continue to focus on patron safety uh, and comfortability um, in preparation for the Metro services commencing in late 2024. It's another step in delivering uh, the, an accessible Brisbane Metro that ensures Council's goal to be a city where everyone can move around uh, easily and safely. Before I finish, Mr Chair, I would just like to uh, share in the uh, in a great milestone, or share a great milestone that occurred uh, for e-mobility. Uh, over the weekend, of course, on the weekend, we had the NRL Magic Round, as the Deputy Mayor was saying, which we know now uh, is a great, a very great boost in tourism for our city. Uh, we had more than 30,000 visitors uh, visit the city during the event. Uh, each game attracted an average of 49,000 spectators. The Broncos did an excellent job on uh, Friday night and thumped uh, Manly. Uh, my, I did have Tom Trebojevic scoring. Um, the multi did not get up, unfortunately, Chair, but by one leg, which was a real shame. Uh, but we always love the Broncos winning in their home city. Uh, but it was also great to see, Chair, how popular e-mobility uh, was with footy fans, transporting them to and from games and across the city from hotels uh, to venues. Uh, and from South Bank, south of the river, to the north side of the river. Anyone who was in the CBD on Friday night would have seen the vast number of visitors who were around, uh, many of them wearing, as the Deputy Mayor said, NRL jerseys or the uh, Magic Round jerseys. Mr Chair, um, over the whole weekend of Magic Round, we had 50,000 e-mobility trips in total. Uh, and even more exciting was that on Saturday, uh, on Saturday we had our highest, highest daily trip count on e-scooters since we began the e-mobility scheme in 2018. So in five years, uh, we've finally achieved the highest uh, trip count and it was Magic Round uh, that did it, that did it, Chair. Our, um, what, what our scheme allows us is it allows us to get great real-time data and insights uh, out of the scheme. And I note the interjection, maybe, Chair, the last interjection from the Council for Winner Manly. Uh, Ward, who knows, he might be back here next week, but I also know uh, that the Council for Winner Manly Ward has been the greatest supporter of e-mobility rolling out to the Bayside suburbs there, where he wasn't too concerned um, about the injury rate. Um, and in fact, he 
uh, petitioned us to keep the scheme in his suburb. So we know what a great friend and supporter of our e-mobility scheme he has been, and we thank him for that. Um, earlier in the year, as I mentioned uh, last week, Chair, we passed 10 million trips on e-mobility. It's great to see just how popular uh, e-scooters are, uh, not only with the residents of this city, but increasingly the visitors to this city. And we know we see that when we talk to uh, the operators Beam and Neuron. Uh, they monitor the activations uh, that we see, people who've never taken a trip before, who come into town, they download the app, uh, they add a credit card or a PayPal, and they jump on scooters, many of them for the first time, and then they take that back to their city when they go home and they say, hey, isn't this this amazing technology that we have in Brisbane where we don't need to uh, drive a car or rent a car, we can get around the city nice and easily on e-scooters. So uh, another great outcome from Magic Round, and we look forward to many more Magic Rounds in the beautiful city of Brisbane, Chair. I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Is there any further debate? No further debate? Now move to the vote on the report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Wines, Infrastructure Committee report, please. Uh, I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of May, 2023, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Wines and seconded by Councillor Matic that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 2nd of May, 2023, be adopted. Councillor Wines. Thank you, Mr Chair. The, uh, this week's report was by uh, Jamie Mullins, uh, the Manager for Major Projects and Planning in the Transport uh, Planning and Operations branch of the BI Division. Uh, it had discussions of the four major projects, the state's Cross River Rail, uh, the private uh, and state-supported Queens Wharf Brisbane, Brisbane Metro, Brisbane Metro and the, the Green Bridges. Uh, it was uh, prompted by a wonderful tour that the committee took of the Cross River Rail site. Can I thank the CEO of the Cross River Rail Authority for arranging that for us? Um, as uh, councillors have heard me say before, I try and make uh, membership of the, the Infrastructure Committee meaningful uh, and involved, so I try and take the committee places. So can I thank the councillors who did attend for those who were um, curious, myself, uh, Councillor Hutton, uh, Councillor Strunk all attended uh, the tour, so it was open to all members of the committee. It was uh, a very significant project. We would really do appreciate the generosity of the staff there who took us around. It was quite a lengthy and significant tour of the Albert Street uh, portal, the Albert Street component of that particular uh, uh, piece of infrastructure, which I look forward to being able to use at some point in the future. So the notes are, are within the report. I encourage all councillors to consider them and commend the report to the Chamber. Thank you. Any further debate? No further debate. Move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Allen, City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of May, 2023, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 2nd of May, 2023, be adopted. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Before I get uh, to the items on the agenda and the uh, committee meeting from last week, I did want to provide the Chamber with a bit of an update on the City Planning and Suburban Renewal portfolio. It's clear in this portfolio we are getting on with the job, and that includes ensuring that there is a pipeline of housing supply through our development approvals. To April uh, this year, or the calendar year, the Development Services team has approved 1,072 development applications for all types, 168 new high-level development applications for material change of use of a residential nature. And this has resulted in a net increase of approximately 1,455 dwelling approvals, of which 105 units were billed to rent. In total, to April this financial year, so the full financial year, the Development Services team has approved 3,033 development applications of all types, 563 new high-level development applications for material change of use of a residential nature, and this has resulted in a net increase of approximately 3,513 dwelling approvals, of which 881 units were billed to rent, with 254 units of this allocated for affordable housing. These statistics highlight the role the bill to rent model has to play with increasing the supply of housing options in the city. 
And that is why one of the key initiatives from Brisbane's sustainable growth strategy, our housing strategy, is providing incentives for build to rent development by allowing infrastructure charges to be paid over time. This incentive will, insist, uh, will assist the industry in constructing more dwellings sooner and adding more dwellings to the rental market. Now, moving to the uh, committee presentation from last week, we uh, reviewed a um, development approval at 201 Goodaham Road, Pallara, and the approved development site is uh, currently vacant land with a site area of 20,260 square metres and is set to establish the first local community shopping centre in Pallara. Proposed services to be included are retail shops, healthcare services, an indoor gym, food and beverage outlets and a veterinary clinic. The approved development comprises of two storeys, uh, will rise 10 metres in vertical height and provide 288 car parking spaces and 34 bicycle spaces. The development will support the needs of the local community whose catchment is set to increase from 4,600 in 2021 to 9,100 in 2025 and more than 13,000 in 2032. The development at 201 Goodham Road, Pallara, will generate employment during construction and ongoing operation of the centre. Consistent and cohesive landscaping attenuates or attenuates uh, Brisbane's subtropical uh, landscape character and contributes to the microclimate of the neighbourhood site. Council is delighted to see this project progressing to serve the residents of Pallara and I'd like to acknowledge the strong advocacy of the local councillor, Councillor Owen, for the project, and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Is there any further debate? No further debate. Move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Davis, Environment Parks Sustainability Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting of Tuesday, 2nd of May 2023, be adopted. Second. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Davis and seconded by Councillor Mackay that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, 2nd of May 2023, be adopted. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week's committee presentation was on memorials in parks, which was timely following Anzac Day, where I know that all councillors uh, here will have visited a memorial uh, in their local community. As one of Australia's older cities, Brisbane has a significant collection of memorial installations throughout our parkland estate, with 351 memorials in total, 52 of which are war memorials. A memorial can be a statue, an object or structure installed to commemorate a significant event, individual or anniversary, and they have a very special space, uh, place among our public art uh, portfolio, defining a sense of place um, of history and, of course, community. Memorials come in all shapes and sizes and are as diverse as the things that they commemorate. They can often serve multiple purposes as infrastructure as well as art. For instance, we learned that Brisbane's oldest memorial was actually a drinking fountain built in 1867, where Maine's water was first introduced to Brisbane. No expense was spared on the ornate sandstone sculpture, which was erected at a cost of £370, which was a significant amount of money in those days. In 1972, the fountain was formally named in recognition of Walter Hill, who was the first curator of the Brisbane Botanic Gardens. And in May 1988, a further dedication was added to James Thomas Mooney, a volunteer fireman who lost his life attending a fire on Queen Street in 1877, and to all firefighters who have made the ultimate sacrifice. The Walter Hill Fountain is a great example of how memorials can grow and evolve over time, reflecting different moments in history and events that were significant in Brisbane at the time. Uh, but perhaps our best known memorials are the various Anzac memorials that can be found in parks across the city, the most iconic of which is at Anzac Square. We learned that Brisbane's war memorials were part of a movement in the years following the First World War, which was the first major war in which Australia fought and remains the most costly in terms of human life. The earliest Anzac memorial at Mowbray Park actually commenced construction during the war, uh, with the foundation stone laid in 1916. 
The Anzac memorials are usually built from materials like granite, marble, sandstone and bronze and take the form of statues, obelisks and monoliths. Like the Walter Hill Fountain, these memorials have evolved over time, with further embellishments being added to honour those who lost their lives in subsequent conflicts, both civilian and military. The Anzac memorials have an important place both in the history of our nation and of our city. They are often funded through donations uh, from the public, and given the cost of the materials involved, it sometimes took years to raise those funds. And today, many community groups, including RSLs, veterans associations, and even school PNCs, continue to actively participate in the preservation of these memorials. Maintaining these memorials and preparing them for events like Anzac Day and Remembrance Day is a very big job, and one which is undertaken with great pride by our public space operations team. In the lead up to these events, work like cleaning, repairing and planting of gardens is undertaken in addition to regular maintenance activities, which PSO performs year round and often with the help of the community. But memorials are not just about the past, Mr Chair. We are seeing proposals for new and exciting designs which incorporate technology like QR codes, videos uh, and interactive digital experiences. Whatever form they take, Brisbane's memorials perform an important job in sustaining memories and enlightening visitors and future generations to the events which have shaped our community identity and values. And I'd just like to thank the officers uh, for the very informative presentation and for all of the work that they do uh, in preserving um, and protecting these treasured features uh, in our parks across the city. And I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Is there any further debate? No further debate. I move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Marks, City Standards Committee report, please. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 2nd of May 2023 be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Marks and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting dated Tuesday 2nd of May 2023 be adopted. Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just briefly before I get to the report, I just want to um, make some comments around the question that Councillor Johnson had for the Lord Mayor last week um, in regards to Oxley Road. I know there was concerns that Councillor Johnson had um, about, in particular, grass growing through Oxley Road and wanting to know if the fact that it had flooded um, was it being resurfaced. In short, the answer, yes, Oxley Road did go underwater during the flood. Has it been identified resurfacing? The answer is no. So, following the recent um, vehicle, as all the councillors know, all the roads that were um, flooded during our recent event did go under some major testing in those spaces and they were inspected by officers. Now, Oxley Road in particular was last inspected by officers in November 22 to assess whether the road met Council's intervention standard for road surfacing. So at the time of the inspection, officers noted that the road had received the crack sealing treatment in mid-21 and the treatment designed to extend the serviceable life of an asphalt had been planned between resurfacing. Now, look, I understand the crack sealing treatment um, isn't a attractive thing that we do with our roads? No, it's not. But does it save ratepayers um, lots and lots of money? Yes, it does. Um, the other issue we have with road um, resurfacing or patching in particular when you do large failures, um, and this happens when we actually put in traffic lights as well, which is also a big annoyance of mine. We do these beautifully roads um, resurfaced and then we cut into them. Um, so with traffic lights, they have to um, cut down into the asphalt in order to lay the cabling for the traffic lights to work. And my question, of course, is, well, why don't you do that at the time of the road resurfacing? And the answer purely and simply is you would have to put the cables down so far down into the asphalt they would be ineffective um, because of the heat of the asphalt being poured on top of the cabling. So fair call. Does it look great? No, it doesn't. But until someone comes up with some better cabling, that's what we're stuck with. And the other, the other situation we have, of course, is when roads are cut into like that, um, you're going to have the grass growing through the cracks because you've got the dirt um, and the seeds flying across um, roads as, and then the, the grass grows through it. Does it, does, it, does it look attractive? No, it does not look attractive at all. I agree with you completely, Councillor Johnson. 
Does it affect the, the efficiency and the efficacy of the road? No, it does not. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't have the budget to resurface roads just because they look untidy, which um, is a, a, a thing for another day. Um, I also want to just talk about the committee meeting that we had last week. The presentation was on the Kedron Brook Bikeway restoration project. Um, huge project, absolutely massive. In fact, so big, three chairs visited the site of that particular project. That's how many of us were actually involved. There were some very, very amazing statistics that um, Shane, as a manager of construction, um, talked about and gave to the committee. Um, I know there was some concern amongst the local residents and obviously local councillors that were involved in this space um, about the length of time that this project was taking to be done. Um, there was many constraints in this space. One of them obviously that we you, you were working in the same space, um, contaminated land. They had issues that they had to deal with. Um, and I think it has been mentioned here in the chambers before at the time, but there was these things called these tusk frogs, which I understand are ugly yeah, little things, but apparently frog. Very, very important. Um, it was their breeding time, so um, they need we privacy. they needed privacy. And I'll take that interjection through you, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, it's a bit like the bats. We can't do any work around trees where bats in them in the breeding time because it disturbs them. So, um, and of course, there was a fair amount of public interaction with the council officers on the ground, um, speaking to a, a huge amount of residents that are, and people on their bikes and walkways walking through that space. Um, there was a lot of work done that you potentially wouldn't see. It's like a house when you renovate. The first thing you want to do is the stumping, which if anyone knows that, you've got to do work from your foundation up, otherwise you're wasting your time and your energy and your money. Um, we had things like 900 tonnes of rock, 2,100 cubic metres um, on, on, you know, on top of the project. We had 5,000 plants and we had 2,500 square metres of turf. So that's potentially what the residents will see. They'll see the nice concrete pathway, which I have to say looks absolutely beautiful. Um, and then they will see the, the planting as they come up. Um, but what you don't see is all the work that's gone into it, as I said, the foundation. So I want to take the opportunity to publicly thank the officers for the huge amount of work they did. I am aware it took a while, but as I said, there were some extenuating circumstances that just had to be dealt with, and there's nothing you can do about that. Our officers um, very patiently worked with everybody and, any, and all the chairs that we all visited the site at the time and took time out to explain it to us. Um, and then I said, Shane's um, team in that construction space did an outstanding job, and um, I congratulate them. And, and we have made it bigger and better, as the Lord Mayor's directions are with anything that was flood-related. So. Um, Hopefully it will be stand for the next That's third the time. That's the idea. Thank you, Mr Thank Chair. Thank you. Further debate? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on the Kedron Brook bikeway restoration. Um, and I note that the LNP administration has used this as a flagship um, project for uh, flood recovery in Brisbane. Um, I note there's no funding that's attributed to uh, the report before us today, but I presume this has cost some hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, and it would be interesting to find out uh, exactly how much. Um, it is very interesting as well, um, as Councillor Marx has stated, that uh, the LNP administration is building things back bigger and better uh, as part of uh, flood recovery. Um, I also note that this project has been fully funded by Council and presumably Council will be seeking reimbursement through the National Disaster uh, uh, Administrative Arrangements. Now, the really, really interesting part of this is this project is located, if not wholly, substantially within LNP wards on the north side. I don't think there's any labour areas that uh, the Ketron Brook Park. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Um, I think that I think they're just having a bit of a grumble, but uh, so I think I'm on the money. It's it's all in a. It's all in an LNP. <laughs> Councillors, please. Councillors. Order, yeah, please. Councillor Wines. That's enough. That's the LNP councillors, <laughs> Councillor Adams, Councillor Wines, but that's okay. They're not named. Yeah, just said Councillor Wines, Councillor Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, not Councillor Adams, who's been interjecting. Uh, so um, this, is, this is a big project that's been funded uh, directly by Council. Uh, through LNP wards. Uh, and I presume, as I said, Council will uh, seek reimbursement. 
Now, over in poor old Tennyson Ward, uh, where we had 3,000 flooded homes, we've got uh, people who are still in distress, they can't get their insurance sorted, they're waiting for builders, they're still waiting on buyback and or resilient funding. We still have people 15 months, 16 months on from the floods whose living uh, situation has not been resolved. Um, you would think that perhaps Council might be putting the same amount of effort into restoring flood-damaged community facilities in Tennyson Ward as they are in the LNP wards on the north side. But no, that's not the case. Um, so whilst things are being built back bigger and better on the north side in the LNP wards, Cactoblastus Corner is the only park left in Brisbane that remains closed and catastrophically damaged, with no plans by council to repair it. In fact, one of the motions that the LNP is blocking from debate is pushing for funding for Cactoblastus Corner, a riverfront park in Sherwood, to be fixed. This park does not deserve the same treatment, according to the LNP, as the Kedron Brook bikeway. They are funding that project directly. Um, this council has said, no, no, we couldn't possibly fund Cactobactus Corner uh, re rehabilitation. Um, that funding has to come from a grant from the state government. So here's the double standard. Whilst in LNP areas, public infrastructure is being built back, as Councillor Marx has said, bigger and better, not in non-LMP wards. In fact, in my ward, nothing's being built back better. It's not even being built back at Cactoblastus Corner. We're 16 months on from the floods and nothing has happened. It's fenced off and a bit of make safe work's been done. But that's not the only one. That's not the only one. You'd think maybe they'd get the idea right. Uh, the Sherwood Arboretum pontoon. Uh, second time the Sherwood Arboretum pontoon's been washed away. Um, this is a heritage-listed district access park, again on the river, uh, and is of course the LNP doing the same investment in that flooded, damaged asset as they are at the Ketron Brook Bikeway? No, they are not. They're not directly funding that like they did in the LNP wards on the north side. Again, it's like, oh no, there's no funding for that. You're going to have to ask uh, for the grant funding from the state government. Uh, so here's the double standard. But wait, there's more. The Taylor Bridge Playground. Now, this is the park that flooded in 2011, and council uh, basically hosed off the swings that were 20 years old then, and then refused to replace the pontoon that was lost. So they wouldn't do that then. Um, now the, the playground has been removed, and we're still waiting on the new playground uh, to be delivered. Um, I, I'm told it's coming this year. Uh, so that's still not been done either. And then there's the riverbank landslip at Corinda, where part of the Brisbane River Bank fell into the river and exposed all the illegally dumped waste that went over the side from the old Montrose redevelopment. Is council going to fix that? No, there's no plans to do that either. So here we have parks, pontoons and riverbank areas in Brisbane that the LNP administration is not fixing, has no plans to fix, has allocated no funding to fix, and certainly not in Councillor Marx's own ward, um, built them back bigger and better. But it's so nice to know, isn't it, that the LNP councillors on the north side have got a gold-plated Kedron Brook <laughs> bikeway fully restored, fully paid for by council, uh, and that was done up front and done as a priority. Meanwhile, over in one of the worst flood-affected wards in the whole city, we've got parks closed, community assets damaged and no funding from council to fix them. The double standard and the hypocrisy by the LNP administration is shameful. They are prepared to fund projects in their own ward and crow about them publicly, yet they refuse to even debate the need for funding for projects in Tennyson Ward, and there is absolutely no reason that they should be continuing to block 
that motion, which remains on the table. And I've repeatedly asked for it to be put back into circulation for debate, but the LNP has said no. So I'm sure the LNP is really, really proud of the work that it's doing in the Kedron Brook bikeway. And I'm happy that people on the north side have had their bikeway fixed, but I think it is shameful that the LNP will not invest the same amount of time, money and resources in fixing flood-damaged community assets, parkland and riverfront areas uh, in Tennyson Ward that they do in their own LNP wards. That is hypocritical behaviour by the LNP. They are elected to represent the whole city, and it's clear by their actions that they are failing to do this. Further debate. Councillor Marks. Oh, sorry, Councillor Wine. Sorry, um, uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Just, uh, just a bit um, later. I just want to speak to this report, and I just want to take a moment to thank the officers for their work to repair the Kedron Brook uh, bikeway, and in particular the Kedron Brook itself. Uh, the Kedron Brook is a. Um, uh, a very important waterway that reaches from the very western end of the city all the way through your ward to the ocean. Uh, it changes names at certain points, but it is a vital um, link for environment, for recreation, for drainage. It is a, um, a very, very important part of our community. And can Councillor I Johnston, thank, please, you've had your say. Uh, can I thank the, the officers for their commitment to this place and the ongoing work uh, to it? Um, the, the creek itself has a sort of a, a rock um, bed that shifts through the creek, and that's one of the reasons why there was so much damage, because the Mitchelton and Inogra reaches of the creek uh, picked up a lot of their, um, the sediment and then dropped it at Orderly. And so where there was, was once uh, bridges and creek lines, you would have, um, it was waist high um, sediment. And so where there was like a creek and a bridge, you could walk over the bridge and see this much of the handle above the, the, the sediment in the place. It was a remarkable, a remarkable amount of um, uh, silt had shifted. We're talking thousands of cubic metres in some places. And that's the merely the, the Mitchelton to Orderly component that doesn't speak to the significant damage in Grange and Gordon Park and further east. Um, and Stafford, exactly right. Uh, some of the scouring on the banks the restitution of the bridges has taken a lot of work. Uh, we make light of the Tusk frog, but it did push this work back three months to ensure that the frogs that were found in the banks at the Wolverhampton parts, which is the Stafford, por Stafford portion, the Stafford reach, um, they, their wellbeing was preserved. The bridge is back. We are now considering options to make sure that if there is a, a flood of significant or comparable size in the future, we will not lose that bridge or that access again. Uh, you have to take an opinion that cycling is an equivalent transport mode to motoring or walking or public transport and to ensure that we keep our principal active transport routes like the Ketron Brook Bikeway open as much as possible. Now, there's been a policy change to make sure that we clean them as though they were roads in a, in a flood event in the future, but also to restore them to a resilience that would endure a comparable event uh, if it were to occur again. There has been tremendous damage in that corridor, but can I also say there's been tremendous patience by the residents, and I thank them for that. Uh, and I can, uh, can I assure them that the work that this council is doing will mean that their facility is better, cleaner and more resilient and more beautiful into the future. So can I thank the officers for their work, can I thank the residents for their patience, and I look forward to the ongoing commitment to this key Northside asset. Further debate? Councillor Marks, summing up? No. Move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Howard, Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of May 2023, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday 2nd of May 2023 be adopted. Councillor Howard. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. And before moving to the report, um, it's been a little while since I've been able to address Council on 
the many, many things that the Schrinner Council has that are more to see and do across Brisbane. And I'd just like to mention one or two things that have happened uh, recently um, when, when we were in recess. Um, on Saturday night, we had light up the night ball that was for LGBTIQ domestic violence uh, fundraiser. And I want to say a big thank you to Ben Bajanson for uh, the, the founder of this organisation. This was the second year that they've held this uh, ball in City Hall. They had 100 more people. And I'm pleased to say that um, there were two extra tables. One was from our River City Pride people. And I want to say again a big thank you to River City Pride for all of the work and the advocacy that, uh, that they do within Brisbane City Council. And uh, my own table, which was able to host Councillor Atwood and Councillor Cunningham and quite a number of, oh, and the, the the good Senator James Mackay um, and quite a number of... Uh, oh, McGrath. Sorry, I just elevated you uh, <laughs> through you. But anyway, um, James uh, McGrath. And can I just say, it was a fantastic event and Ben did um, an amazing job. And for, for that organisation to have been able to achieve that in two short years is just uh, truly amazing. Um, I also want to mention that we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Australian Red Cross Night Cafe, and that is, uh, we, we had to wait a couple of years because of COVID, so it was actually, I think, 22 years. Um, but of course, the Australian Red Cross Night Cafe provide valuable service to um, our less, um, less uh, our, our more vulnerable people across Brisbane um, on a Tuesday night um, right here in City Hall. So it was great to uh, meet with the Red Cross and um, many of their supporters uh, to celebrate that great milestone. Um, I also attended the Brisbane Youth Service and their Youth Homelessness Matters Day afternoon tea. Again, a fantastic organisation and I want to say a big thank you to Pam and her team for the amazing work that they are doing in these very difficult circumstances at the moment and uh, youth homelessness is really something uh, that uh, you know they are just struggling uh, to, to work with so it was great to see so many people there um, supporting that, um, that, that group. Um, we also um, had the 4MBS Festival of Classics 30th anniversary function at uh, Government House. And again, uh, you know, the amazing work that these people have been doing over so many years was recognised by the Governor and it was great to be there um, to support them with that. We had the Trans Community Awards for 2022. And again, another group of people where um, their awards night is growing and growing and the ability to recognise the community members and the fantastic work that they do um, was also um, very good. Um, I want to thank uh, Councillor Wines and his team um, for the wonderful flag that now appears in outside the Wickham Hotel. Um, it has been a great success and uh, um, Councillor Wines and I went down there early one morning and I can tell you Councillor Wines that many a photograph has been taken on that flag since it was painted uh, outside the Wickham and it's become quite the iconic um, part of, uh, of, of Fortitude Valley so um, really grateful for, for that. Um, the Lord Mayor and I also attended the 2023 Queensland Music Awards and many of you will remember that I was talking about this just before we broke for recess. And so it is my great delight to tell you that DZ Death Rays won the heavy award for Paranoid. And I have to say that I did storm the stage as, a, as I was so excited. We didn't think that anyone from DZ Death Race was there. And so um, John Collins invited me up because he knows I'm such a great fan. And just as I was about to accept the award, someone from DC Death Rays arrived too. I think he was a little confused about why this strange woman was standing on the stage, but can I just say how very proud I am of the guys, because as we know, Brisbane-based and just such a success. And I really want to thank um, all of those that were involved in the Q Queensland Music Awards, because it really is uh, such a fantastic um, opportunity for us to um, recognise and, and recognise some of our homegrown um, artists that have just done so well. Um, the album of the year, which is presented by Brisbane City Council, was for ballpark music, Weirder and Weirder. So um, great opportunity. Um, the, the awards night was fantastic. The Lord Mayor um, certainly enjoyed himself and it was really wonderful to see so many local artists recognised. 
Moving to the report, we had a committee presentation on the Brisbane Writers' Festival for 2023, and the artistic director from the Brisbane Writers' Festival um, provided us with some, a, a, a fantastic um, presentation, and I encourage all councillors in the chamber to go online and to have a look at the presentation because um, this festival, which was founded in 1962 and is held from the 10th to the 14th of May, um, hosts 160 events and approximately 360 writers and artists in a celebration of the Brisbane and Australian literary landscape. And the festival acts as a key part of the writing network and aims to bring together authors, publishers, printers and critics, while exposing Brisbane authors to a wider audience. There are educational programs such as Wordplay that invite students from prep to year 12 to grow and experiment with their creativity, and the Love Your programs uh, provides a celebration of young adult fiction amongst our libraries. Um, so again, a fantastic presentation. Um, copies of the program have been sent to all councillors with the encouragement of them to um, promote that through their own wards. And I'm delighted to tell you that as of this morning, there are 12,500 tickets have been sold. 57 sessions have been sold out, which is over 75% booked, and they are on track to be the best-selling Brisbane Writers Festival ever. So congratulations to them, and I'll leave debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Is there any further debate? No further debate. We move to the vote on this report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cunningham, Finance and City Governance Committee report, please. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 2nd of May 2023 be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Cunningham and seconded by Councillor Huang that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting dated Tuesday 2nd of May 2023 be adopted. Councillor Cunningham. Mr Chair, our presentation and first committee uh, report back was the net borrowings report, which included an economic update from the Corporate Treasurer in Council. We've recently had the latest inflation data from the ABS showing inflation at 7% nationally and 7.4% in Brisbane. Clearly, households are hurting at the moment and Council, just like all other levels of government, is feeling the impacts. That's why we work really hard at Council to try and receive whatever external funding we are eligible for, Mr Chair. It helps us deliver great projects and services and keep downward pressure on our rates. It's something that this whole chamber should support. We also had the Bank and Investment Report for March with the CFO on hand to answer any questions of the committee and I'll leave debate to the chamber. Thank you. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> next uh, item before us is petitions. Are there any petitions? No petitions. That would be unusual circumstance. No petitions. Calling once, calling twice, calling thrice. <laughs> oh, uh, we don't. Okay, so as there are no petitions, we move on. There's no need to ask for a motion to no, present those okay. petitions. No. Um, councillors, um, general business, are there any statements required as a result of an office of the independent assessor or a councillor ethics committee order? No one rising. Are there any matters of general business? Who wants to go first? Good. Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I rise this afternoon to speak about... Yeah, well, yeah, okay, we'll go with Councillor Atwood and then come back. Okay, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, apologies. Yeah. Um, about the Canrow Street Festival, and I wanted to thank some incredible businesses for helping to bring this event to life after a two year hiatus. The Canrow Street Festival was first held in January 2020 after completing the Village Precinct project upgrade. It was such an incredible transformation to a very old and tired shopping precinct, and the community's gratitude was certainly evident when the Lord Mayor and I opened it on the 30th of January in 2020. 
The street was packed with locals and the stories from local businesses was incredible. Michael from Giovanni said that they had their biggest night ever and week on week their sales increased, unfortunately until COVID hit. But these stories were repeated with other local businesses down there in Kenrose Street. The bakery started to close at 2pm instead of 6pm because they were just selling out every single day. So it's incredible to hear those stories. So the Kenrose Street Festival team were so excited to bring this back um, as an annual event to promote the local businesses and showcase our beautiful Karina community. So we were really excited to bring it back in 2021, but unfortunately it was cancelled due to a COVID lockdown. And in February 2022, the bakery and the music shop flooded. It closed the music shop for three months and the bakery for 12 months. So to say that this year's Kenrose Street Festival was a long time coming would be, a, um, would be an understatement. This year's Kenrose Street Festival really celebrated all of the businesses being back open down there on Kenrose Street and celebrating Ian and Laura's journey of rebuilding their bakery. This year we also welcomed two new businesses, a pizza shop and a dog wash. The pizza shop said that the Kenrose Street Festival night, they sold as much that night as they would in a normal week, so they were really, really grateful. They were really over the moon to share their amazing food with our community and the same has been going on. They've been getting busier and busier every night. The trusty dog wash also said their inquiries have gone through the roof and they're hiring additional staff now. So I loved hearing those stories. I just also wanted to leave a text message with you from Ian from the Kenrow Street Bakery. Lisa, I felt very privileged to have the Lord Mayor attend our street party with his family. For me, it was a fantastic insight to see how much he loves Brisbane and I appreciated his time to chat. His family are so genuine and it is evident how much he loves our community at large. It made me and Laura feel really special. So I wanted to thank the Lord Mayor for, take, for giving up every single weekend to come to all of our events. It makes our community feel really special. I also wanted to thank him for funding these events um, and to continue to upgrade our tired old shopping precincts into thriving community hubs. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Collier. Thank you. Nadine, this is your first speech. Welcome to the Chamber. Thank you, Chair. I acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to owners past and present. I acknowledge the ongoing efforts to protect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. I support an Indigenous voice to Parliament for our First Nations people. It is an enormous privilege to stand here and represent my beautiful community in this Chamber. Today, I have the opportunity to share my values, my beliefs and my thanks all of which brought me to this place. Morningside Ward, which includes the suburbs of Balmoral, Balimba, Hawthorne, Morningside, Norman Park, Seven Hills and Camp Hill, is the most incredible place. What makes Morningside Ward really special, though, is the people who make up this wonderful community. So every single day, I will strive to bring the best to the people of Morningside and for the people of Brisbane. It is what they deserve. This community is filled with people who share my passion in making our area a wonderful place to live, to raise a family and preserving our way of life. I acknowledge the many incredible community groups and organisations who make this area what it is. There are literally hundreds of you and all of you are amazing. Through my own involvement in the Balimba Community Centre as the immediate past president, the Morningside One Camp Seven Neighbourhood Watch, the I Love Balimba and 4171 Facebook page, and the local Bulimbran District RSL sub-branch to volunteer coordinate for Anzac Day, just to name a few, I've been able to see in first hand the dedication of many local residents. I feel incredibly energised to work alongside my local community groups and organisations to get the best community building outcomes for them. I very much believe that we all have a responsibility to ensure that we leave our community in better shape than what we found it. Brisbane right now is at a crossroad and the decisions of this council will go down in history. In this chamber, the decisions we make must put the interests of residents first and for too long, for 20 years of this LNP administration, they have not. The way that we move around this city is influenced by the decisions of this council. The LNP have spent billions on the inner city metro without tackling improved cycling infrastructure or congestion, bu congestion busting in the suburbs like mine where it takes over 45 minutes to catch a bus less than five kilometres to the CBD. What's worse, 
this admi LNP administration cut the Norman Park ferry service. That is their solution to addressing traffic congestion in my community, to cut services. We must address housing availability and the cost of living. The LNP have no plan. Last year, we, we saw the largest increase in rates in over a decade under this LNP administration, but the suburbs are getting less. We are facing a genuine climate crisis, and we owe it to the residents of Brisbane to be a truly carbon neutral council and make Brisbane a more livable, net zero emission city. Instead, the LNP refuses to act and introduce FOGO, the number one way a council can reduce the carbon emissions of every single resident. The choice at the next election will be clear. A 20-year-old LNP administration only in it for themselves or a Labor-led council who will put residents first. The Brisbane that I know and that I love is one that is vibrant, it is progressive and it is inclusive. It deserves that kind of representation. Not an administration that is so focused on looking it back, it cannot look forwards. A vision of hope and progress for the city can only be delivered by a Labor team in council, a team that I am incredibly proud to be a part of. I particularly want to thank through you, Chair Councillors Cassidy, Cummings, Strunk and Griffiths for their support. It is a true rep uh, privilege to represent both my community but also the party that I love. And so I must particularly acknowledge a few very important people without whom my presence in this chamber is, would not be possible. I am the next in a history of strong women who have represented the Morningside Ward. I certainly must acknowledge firstly the formidable former councillor for Morningside Ward, Cara Cook, whose professional and personal support has had a huge impact on my life. There is simply no one like her. She is strong, passionate, determined, all of these qualities that we should look and find within ourselves. She lives her values every single day. There are not enough words to, that I can say to thank Cara personally and on behalf of our community. And so now, it is up to me to continue to be the strong voice in council that the Morningside Ward deserves. I acknowledge the thousands of Brisbane City Council workers Please know that you are valued by the Labor Party and we will always stand up to fight for the best paying conditions that you deserve alongside our union movement. I thank my union, the United Workers Union, for their continued support. I want to acknowledge my village, those who have given such invaluable support to me, not only over the past few months but over many years. Firstly, the Humphreys, Atkinson and Ibrahim families, you are my family. The wonderful local ALP members from the Morningside Ward, to my friends and biggest supporters, Grace, Renee, Brian and Barb, Rachel, Jess, Brooke, Simon, Kirsten, the Robinsons. You all know how I feel about you, but I want to put my thanks on record today. Like many other families, mine is large and um, a little complicated, but of course, I love them all so very much. My husband's family, who are now my own, um, I particularly acknowledge my father-in-law, Buzz, and thank you for your love and support. My husband's late mother, Karen, who we miss every day. The Lehman family, who have been such a big part of my life and helped shape me. The Norris family, who are the most kind and loving people you may ever meet. My sisters, Scout and Millie, my instant best friends. You know me better than I know myself. Thank you. My parents, who have had the greatest impact on my life, my father, Ian, aka Dad of Strong Daughters, who has always encouraged me and supported me to find my voice. My mum, Kathy, who is an inspiration to all that meet her. I am so proud to be your daughter. I couldn't do this without your support. You are always just there for me. Thank you for being on this journey with me. To die, you have nurtured and supported me through absolutely everything. I look up to you. You are the kind of person that we should all aspire to be like. You are the most remarkable person. You raised Millie and I to care deeply for others and be the best people that we can be. It is the greatest privilege to share a love for our wonderful community and to be able to do what we do now together. I owe the most gratitude to my loving husband, Matt, and my daughter, Maisie. I hope that I make you both proud. I love you both bigger than the whole sky. To serve your community with the support of those you love is the greatest honour and I will work hard to do my community proud. I'm just getting started and I will always put my community first.
Thank you. For the general business, Councillor Huang. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on a book launch I attended last Saturday. Uh, Mr. Chair, last Saturday, the Australian Taiwan Cultural Foundation launched a publication called Taiwanese Australians in Queensland. This book is divided into seven sections. Of course, the first two sections are acknowledgements from office holders, both local and from Taiwan, including the president of Taiwan and also our Premier uh, Palaszczuk and of course our Lord Mayor, Adrian Trina. But the next five sections are divided into topics, uh, the community identity, entrepreneurship, community organizations, social responsibility, and professionals. Mr. Chair, you can tell from the titles of these sections, this is a book about how the Taiwanese community in Queensland, especially in Southeast Queensland, are doing an extraordinary job in contributing to the Queensland community and setting a prime example of how multicultural communities are making the effort to assimilate into mainstream Australian society. As the first Taiwanese-born councillor, I'm immensely proud of the achievements of the Taiwanese community in Brisbane, whether it was supporting charitable causes like Martha Foundation, Royal Brisbane Women's, Women's Hospital Foundation, or Lord Mayor's Charitable Trust, or business successes in retail, construction, and many other professional services. The Taiwanese community is indeed doing its best to make our city, our state, our nation a better place for future generations. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the chair of the foundation, Ms. Melody Chen, and uh, the executive editor, Edward Lin, in putting this publication together and leave a legacy for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. For the speakers, Councillor Massey, noting this is your first speech. I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of Mianjin, Brisbane, the Turrbal and Yagara peoples. I pay my respects to all elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge and welcome all First Nations peoples here with us today. As part of the oldest continuous living culture in the world, the traditional custodians of the city should be held in a place of pride supported in truth-telling, and have a powerful voice in decision-making. Sovereignty was never ceded. This was, and always will be, Aboriginal land. We must work towards treaty. I speak to you warmly now as the newly elect appointed councillor for the Gabba Ward, a position of great privilege, a position that for someone like me has been unimaginable for all their life. I am proudly a queer woman of Filipino and African-American descent who immigrated here at a young age. Reflecting on my childhood and youth in the 90s, I remember growing up in a time when Brisbane was changing and growing, but I also remember never seeing someone like me on TV, in ads, in magazines, or even in public life. The older the got, I got as I continued living in the city, diverse communities became more visible, more present, but this chamber remained largely the same. And the truth is it's not only here, it's at every level of government. And that's why this position of privilege has been so unimaginable, because visibility counts. And as many people have said before me, you can't be what you can't see. So in the city where 31.7% of its population was born overseas, I humbly take pride in being a, the first queer woman of colour in this chamber today. I accept the responsibility of representing the many intersections that make me me, the diverse people across the city that have supported me throughout my life and career through friendships, community support and transformative work that we've done together at all levels, particularly in grassroots. I humbly take pride in being the first queer woman of colour in this chamber today to ensure that minorities and those that are marginalised have an amplified voice. I humbly take pride in being the first queer woman of colour today in this chamber because I know I won't be the last. I won't be the last because Brisbane is changing again. And today in these times, these times are challenging. Everyday people like me are dealing with a housing crisis, mortgage rate crisis, 
and pressure, rental crisis, we see this chamber's in action <coughs> across our streets and our parks with the growing numbers of homelessness and rough sleepers. Residents are fighting a conflicting development system that sees neighbourhood plans thrown out the window. Instead, we see forced precinct plans, a lack of foresight for sustainable mixed development, density development across the city, no genuine community consultation, or any accountability for the social infrastructure needed for high density populations to thrive. When will this council make developers earning hundreds and millions of dollars every year pay their fair share? In this city, we see the continued prioritization beyond all else of cars, depleting the opportunities for new active transportation corridors for walkers, cyclists, and scooter commuters to safely reach their destination. We now have a council known for turning inner city green spaces gray prioritising commercialisation of publicly owned space time after time. I could go on, and in time I will, I'm sure. But you see, to get back to my point about not being the last, the point is the residents of the city have had enough of this tired and unimaginative LNP council. As we approach the 20th year of a Liberal-run council here in Mianjin, Brisbane, we can all honestly recognise in this chamber, I think, that this city's people expect more from us. Residents across the city want a voice. They want to be heard. And they know 20 years, nearly 20 years on, they live in a Brisbane whose governing body listens and acts less and less in their interests. I take on this role with commitment to the residents of the Gabba to work hard for and with them. I take on this role with a commitment to empowering voices, but also listening. I take on this role by sending a notice. What was once unimaginable to me, to many people like me, has now happened. So my message to the people of the Gabba and Brisbane is, what is possible in the future is limitless. What I mean by this, is this city and its residents can be listened to, can thrive with better active and public transport. They can have access to green space and community hubs where they can build genuine local connections. They can have the contributions of local artists valued and nurtured. They can have a say on how their neighbourhoods look like and so much more. In this future, deep systemic social issues are tackled by us here, honestly, through generosity and by hard work. This pe the people of the city will have their say because change is coming. And so to conclude, I want to thank my partner, Mel, whose support is invaluable to me, my closest and dearest friends and family. To the Queensland Greens, I thank you for your support and confidence. And finally, but most importantly, I want to thank the residents and communities across the Gabba who have warmly welcomed me. Your support means the world to me. Thank you, Councillor Massey. <laughs> Is there any further general business? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Chair. I just wish to um, speak about a local matter, O'Callaghan Park. Um, if you want to see what we mean when we say suburban neglect under this LNP Council, you need look no further than O'Callaghan Park in Zilmia. Uh, the Sporting Precinct is a powerhouse on the north side. It's home to the North Star Soccer Club, the Zilmia Eagles AFL, AFL Queensland, the Zilmia PCYC Honey Badgers Olympic Weightlifting Club uh, and the licensed Zilmia Sports Club. Years ago, these clubs were engaged by Council to get their views on the future of the site and some amazing opportunities that were identified to support the growth of these sports and to give um, that hard-working community of Zilmia some great facilities. 
but years have gone by and that master plan at O'Callaghan Park has only collected dust. Clubs are frustrated and so are local residents. Half the site is now totally unused and Council has no plans to reopen it. The Lord Mayor needs to stop spending our rates exclusively in the inner city and start investing in our suburbs. Funding these upgrades in Zilmia is a priority for me in my submission to the Lord Mayor in his budget this year and my community wants it to be a priority for the Lord Mayor as well. Thank you. Further speakers in general business? Councillor Johnson. Oh, I could have kept that going a bit longer for me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you. Yes, I wanted to rise uh, to speak briefly on uh, the Lord Mayor's um, announcement uh, regarding the uh, Walter Teller Bridge duplication or the Indrapilly Chelmer Bridge. Um, I, thank you. I'm a little bit um, disappointed in Council's actions. Uh, it's been several months since I called for the files and they were only given to me about a week ago. Uh, and Council has known for many weeks that it was going to put a flyer out this week. Uh, council officers did ring and offer a briefing, which is coming tomorrow, um, but nobody in Council has had the courtesy to brief me in advance of this issue going out to the public. And as people in the chamber know, this is an issue that I asked the Lord Mayor about a few months ago via a question directly in the chamber. Um, Brisbane City Council promised almost a year ago to update residents about the outcome of the feasibility study and failed to do so until it was publicly shamed into action. I can see from the minutes of internal discussions uh, that discussions have been happening with the relevant chair of council, and I presume that is Councillor Wines, for over a year. There have been ongoing discussions with the senior leadership of the LNP about this pro project for a year. No one thought that our community should be updated. Uh, now, I don't think that's good enough. The bigger problem, though, is what the Council has actually released and the feasibility study itself. Let me start here. Uh, about 33 per cent of people indicated in the feasibility study that they wanted a new bridge. That means 67 per cent of people did not. And as the Lord Mayor mentioned earlier, there was another percentage of people that wanted to widen the Walter Teller Bridge, which is not possible. 34 per cent of people, actually the highest amount, wanted improvements to public and active transport through the corridor. About another 20 per cent want improvements to local intersections around the bridge on the north side and the south side, um, which are a huge part of the problem. Brisbane City Council, however, uh, has in its flyer that it is publicly released uh, indicated in a very sleight of hand way, I think, that 70 per cent of people support uh, a new bridge. And then there's an or this or that. So they don't want to actually disclose the numbers and make it clear to people um, what the, the public feedback was. You do have to read the document to uh, find that. Um, of course, the flyer has the Lord Mayor's face on it, as we all uh, know. That is the number one prerequisite for any LNP administration flyer. And Councillor Massey, was that included in your councillor training briefing? Uh, councillor Wicks, yes. Uh, that uh, when they came to talk to you from there. That's the prerequisite for any council material. It's got to have a giant picture of the Lord Mayor on it. I'm surprised that wasn't mentioned. They might have said you should put it in your materials. That's the way they like to do things. The biggest problem with the way in which the LNP administration is approaching this project is it is playing political games. At no point has there been a proper look at whether or not uh, there should be a bridge duplication between Chelma and Indrapilly. The presumption, it's clear, has already been made by the LNP that it will be done there. The presumption, or as I see it, the fix is in because the LNP has presented, quote, six options, all of which are essentially the same option, which is a duplicated bridge which then feeds over the rail line at Indrapilly and back into Coonan Street, Indrapilly. 
Now, anybody, anybody with a brain in the western suburbs, and I know the Lord Mayor will stand up and go, she's not an engineer, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, well, I've lived out there for a very long time and I use the bridge pretty much on a daily basis. And like every other resident in my ward, we know the bridge is not the only problem. The problem is the intersection of Coonan Street and Westminster Street, which is a failed intersection without proper turning lanes. Now, of course, the LNP administration does not want to address this. That intersection, which is the single biggest choke point uh, for residents, isn't even mentioned in the flyer. Residents on the south side want to turn they want to get down into the educational precinct, to the schools, to the university, and they want to be able to get to their places of employment. Uh, and the university is a huge employer in our area. So the biggest problem that we face is that the intersection of Coonan Street and Westminster Street doesn't function. As a result, the right-hand turn lane banks up, blocks back over the river, blocks onto the Chelmer side of the bridge, and a huge part of the reason the bridge is blocked is because the cars can't turn right at Westminster Street to get around into Indrapilly to uh, get to the schools and the university, where their children go. We share catchments. Chelmer and Graceville are in the catchment of Indrapilly State High School. It is a connected community. Plus St Peter's, Brigidine, Holy Family, Ambrose Tracy, uh, did I say St Peter's? Like, you know, you name it. There's a bunch of schools. And, you know, some people on the north side send their girls to one of the best, or the best girls' school probably in Brisbane, St Aidan's at Corinda. So some traffic goes the other way. What the council, yeah, what the, that doesn't count. What the council has done is to set up uh, a solution that is doomed to fail. There are no options being presented. The only option is uh, a bridge over the river and another bridge, as you heard the Lord Mayor say today, over the Indrapilly Rail Station, feeding traffic back into Coonan Street. Now, anybody who's driven up Coonan Street at the moment knows that it's probably the most um, diabolical bit of road in all of Brisbane um, due to the botched project by the LNP um, that I don't really know what they're getting on with as to whether or not it's actually fully funded or not, um, but it seems like they want some more money from the federal government to fund a project that's already, I think, run over bu budget by about 25 per cent. So they just want to feed more traffic back into one of the most congested road corridors in Brisbane. That will not give residents who want to go to the Knowledge Precinct in St Lucia and Indrapilly the opportunity to turn right. The solution, the only solution that Council is putting up for the bridge, there are no other options, is a straight north-south alignment down Coonan Street. Now that fundamentally fails. From my point of view, and my position is clearly on the public record about this, Council does not need to start by duplicating the Walter Teller Bridge. The bigger question is, if we are going to have further bridges in the western suburbs for transport, which I think may be necessary, we should be looking at where the best options are, not simply for political game-playing purposes between the State Transport Minister and the Lord Mayor saying we're going to plonk a bridge down between Chelmer and Indrapilly, and then the council's playing silly political games, which is what it's doing by saying the only option we're going to present to the other levels of government are two bridges, including one over the rail line, saying that the state government's going to have to sink Indrapilly rail station down so we can build a flyover over the Indrapilly rail line to force all the traffic into Coonan Street, which must go north into town, which is not where the traffic wants to go. Now, the LNP administration have failed to listen to the message
from residents out of this feasibility study. And it's so clear, it was it, it crystal clear to me when I got the files to have a look. Not that anybody from council would brief me, I've read the files. Residents don't want to duplicate the bridge. Some do, but a majority doesn't. They want to see other fixes, and clearly they want to see intersection fixes to make access to the local area better. That has to include Coonan Street. I note in the flyer that Council is prioritising the right-hand turn from Coonan Street into Riverview Terrace to make it easier for people to get to Fig Tree Pocket. Well, yeah, of course they are. That's actually highlighted. There might be two residents. Councillor Johnston, that your time has expired. Uh, are there any other speakers in general business? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I rose to speak on a, a couple of uh, um, events, I suppose, and a, and a turning on of a set of lights uh, in, the, in the ward uh, over the last week. Firstly, um, VSAC, uh, VSAC, the day of uh, full moon, is the most sacred day to uh, millions of Buddhists uh, around the world. Uh, it was on this day of VSAC uh, that uh, two, about two and a half thousand years ago, uh, in the year uh, 623 BC that uh, Buddha was born. Um, this day, the 6th of May, um, just passed, uh, was, celebrate, was celebrated the birth uh, of enlightenment and the passing away of, uh, of Lord Buddha. The message this year was to promote um, social cohesion, understanding and acceptance among human beings and treat, and treat equally to all living beings in loving kindness and compassion. The, uh, the Multicultural Festival of VDAC, um, which is the Buddha's birthday, uh, was celebrated in my ward uh, on uh, this past Saturday, um, and it was hosted by the Sri Lankan Buddhist Monastery. I enjoyed, uh, along with uh, many others, of course, and some did Gintiris as well, which I'll come to, uh, a colourful um, uh, lantern parade, um, Buddhist uh, stage drama, traditional dancing, of course, and delicious multicultural food. And most of all, celebrating alongside the community that is uh, important, in, uh, important in, the, in the local community that I serve. Congratulations to the executive teachers and parents uh, and volunteers, and there was many volunteers. Matter of fact, the whole, um, the whole evening was uh, conducted by their, uh, uh, by their uh, students, actually, uh, and they did a absolutely terrific job. I want to make special mention to uh, Anton Swan, who has been uh, 30 years as uh, honorary counsel for the Sri Lankan community. He's, uh, he's wanting to retire after 30 years, but they keep saying no. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, so I just hope that uh, I just hope they do find. He hopes that they do find someone else that's suitable. Uh, he's getting a lot of uh, traffic from down south because the consul uh, general uh, that works out of Sydney has uh, it's no longer funded, and uh, so he's getting a lot of a lot of contact from down there. Um, but I mean, he's he's up for it. He he loves his community and and has been a great advocate for all these years. Um, I just also want to mention that the, um, the Sri Lankan uh, monastery uh, and school there, of course, as well, um, they've just uh, opened up a, um, a mindful uh, well-being center next door. They bought an equally large size box of land that they already currently have the school and the monastery on next door uh, along Constantine Street, and they're developing it into a, a, a center there that will actually not just uh, look after their own uh, community, but uh, the general community uh, in, uh, in the Ipswich corridor as well. Um, it's really good to see that they link in with other monasteries uh, when it comes to holding uh, Buddha's birthday. Um, I think uh, a couple of years ago, before COVID, uh, they actually took everything up to the Gudna Temple and, uh, and they held the uh, services up there. So they, 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 they come together. Um, to, to celebrate Buddha's birthday, but they, they don't necessarily, I mean, they do it as a collective sometimes as well, which is really good. Um, the other event uh, that's happening this month uh, is um, 
is the uh, month of uh, May, which uh, signifies the Domestic and Family Violence Prevention Month here in Queensland, an annual um, initiative uh, to raise community awareness of domestic and family violence and coercive control and the support of the services that are available. Uh, this year's theme uh, is, is very much in, in keeping with their, uh, uh, what, they, what, they're, what they're focusing on uh, over the last couple of years, and that is, uh, it's in the con it is our control uh, to end co coercive control. Um, and uh, I, uh, a couple of the, um, I suppose, a couple of the uh, candlelight vigils that, um, that I recently attended uh, over the last couple of years, I should say, uh, except for during COVID, of course, uh, talked very much about that coercive control. Um, since elected, I uh, have always uh, uh, worked towards uh, helping those groups in the, in, the, uh, in the ward that are actually wanting to do work in this area. Uh, and we've um, we funded, uh, when, when requir required, we funded, um, you know, that, that red bench that uh, went into a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the wards. Um, and also just things like um, red roses and things like that for the community to actually uh, um, lay on, on those red bench during uh, DV day or DV week and month. Um, very proud to wear the uh, purple ribbon here as we are uh, today um, in, the, in the chamber. And uh, the candlelight vigil, which I talked to a, a little bit uh, earlier, uh, is, uh, is happening on the 18th of May uh, in the uh, Civic Center. Um, and we, we, we attract quite a few uh, people actually, and we get people people from all, all sort of walks of life and, uh, and, um, and uh, organizations. Uh, and the police, of course, are, are there in numbers um, uh, because uh, they are, of course, at the forefront of uh, having to deal at the coalface with uh, family, uh, with, with uh, domestic and family violence. And uh, I just pay tribute to the work that they do. Uh, it's really hard. And uh, I've talked to a number of constables, uh, senior constables and sergeants over the years. And they tell you some unbelievable stories of what they, uh, what they find when they knock on that door. Uh, finally, I want to talk about the, uh, uh, the set of uh, traffic lights that are actually have the pleasure of uh, switching on uh, this last week uh, on the corner of Rudge Yard and Forest Lake Boulevard. Um, these, these sets of lights uh, were very much uh, looked forward to by the community, although we had some people uh, in the community who thought maybe they should be at the corner of Tawantan Way and Forest Lake Boulevard, which is like one, probably about um, uh, four or 500 meters away. But these set of lights have made an impact already um, in regards to making the uh, intersection of Red Yard and Forest Lake Boulevard very, very safe for pedestrians as well as, uh, as, well as uh, drivers. Um, and the people down in Tawantan Way, which is where we have a, uh, uh, an over 55 precinct, um, who come out onto the road, they can actually see the satellites just up the road at Rudyard Street and they can time their crossing uh, to go down to the shopping center with those lights now as well. So that's a, that intersection uh, would have been, the, well, they wanted the satellites down there as well, but actually the, inter, the, the satellites that are actually in Rudyard and Forest Lake Boulevard are doing most of that work for them. Um, I uh, was able to uh, switch them on, of course, uh, with, uh, with Milton Dick, the uh, federal member for Oxley, Speaker of the House, because uh, it was uh, money that uh, came from uh, black spot funding, which was federal government money. Uh, of course, council um, uh, put, pulled the whole project together, of course, with that money, and uh, so I was very happy to, uh, uh, to spend that, uh, that, uh, that half hour or so uh, with him uh, when we switched the lights on, uh, because it was, um, it was very impactful, actually, when you're uh, able to do something like that. Maybe not as good as maybe turning on the Christmas lights out in King George Square, but uh, I think it's uh, probably more important from a safety point of view. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Further speakers in general business? Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I just uh, wanted to rise and make a few comments about the, uh, 
the Black Spot program that uh, Councillor Strunk was just discussing. And I just wanted to uh, remind uh, him uh, that it was a project where there was uh, eight recorded crashes between 2015 and 2021, seven of which resulted in medical treatment or hospitalisation. Now, uh, it was a Black Spot funded program, which is a federally funded program. Now, I appreciate uh, Councillor Strunk's commitment and celebration of federally funded programs delivered by the Council. Um, I would encourage him to speak to his leader and, and tell him about the power of federally funded council constructed projects. Now, um, as many councillors would know, I like to be at the birth of all the traffic lights, but I wasn't able to make this one. But my officers provided me this wonderful photograph of Councillor Strunk, who I ensured was able to turn the lights on. Uh, and that's a photograph I'll be prepared to table today. So can I just say, traffic lights uh, and safety improvements roads delivered in a partnership between federal, the federal government and the Brisbane City Council are an, an excellent thing. And, they, and I'm glad that uh, Speaker Dick saw the same. Uh, so can I, um, can I encourage Councillor Strunk to, with the same enthusiasm he brought here, to go to his party room and force the issue that we need continued support from the federal government to be able to deliver these sorts of projects? Is there any further general business? Councillors, no further general business. Um, we now move to the adjourned motion uh, from earlier in the agenda, uh, and that was a motion to take uh, a previous motion off the table. Uh, and that motion for debate is, and I'll re reiterate it, the Lord Mayor reinstates council funding for the voluntary flood affected homes buyback scheme in the 23-24 Brisbane City Council budget. Uh, the debate now will now resume from where it left off on the 28th of March. Uh, and to remind councillors, the previous speakers were Councillor Griffiths, Councillor Johnson and Councillor Davis. Uh, and I now call for other speakers. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on uh, this motion that the Lord Mayor reinstates council funding for the voluntary flood affected homes buyback scheme in the 23-24 council budget. Um, as we heard back uh, in March this year, and um, as I'm sure councillors in here are very aware, that um, the Maruka Ward, uh, which Councillor Griffiths represents, was one of the hardest hit parts um, of the city um, uh, as a result of um, river flooding in the 2022 February flood event. Um, the genesis of this motion, though, of course, goes all the way back to um, 2011, uh, when the scheme was put in place after that devastating event. And I think that's been uh, well and truly covered. Um, that was a scheme back then that was supported by all sides of politics because it was a, uh, it was a good program uh, at the time, and it's a good program now, um, to purchase homes that cannot be uh, made flood resilient, whether that's through lifting them uh, out of the way of floodwaters or built, rebuilding them after events in a more resilient way. We've, we saw some of those homes, I think, that would have been rebuilt in a more resilient way at the time, thinking at the time that would have been inundated in February of last year. Um, so obviously that, um, that event in 2011 informed that policy and, and the event in 2022 has informed uh, the, the current policy around um, house buybacks and the um, flood assistance program through the state and federal government funding of $741 million for retrofitting and for house raising, which has seen some, um, uh, some changes and some reform as that's um, rolled out over the last 12 months or so since that package was announced. Um, but in 2016, I think, uh, or maybe 2017, 2016-17, yeah, the 2016 was the last year, I'll take that injection, 2017, uh, so 2016 was the last year, the, the council funding, 2017, that um, program changed. Um, you know, it was interesting at, at that time too, council was dealing um, with, uh, you know, a, um, a project that went on to blow out uh, by hundreds of millions of dollars, the Kingston Smith Drive project at the time, uh, at the same time that council uh, was looking at obviously finding ways to save money. Um, uh, and that was a program that got wound back. Um, what we heard at the time and what we've heard subsequently from the LNP is that, according to them, people didn't want to participate in the program. 
However, we've seen examples of people who were desperate to participate in that program. I have a, uh, have a resident, uh, well, now former resident um, uh, in Zilmia who was deemed not eligible um, under that program, um, but has since had their home bought back um, to be demolished, uh, like their neighbours was following um, the 2011 uh, flood event down there. Uh, so, uh, you know, we certainly don't accept that that program wasn't um, needed to continue um, going forward. Um, so it's not to say that people didn't need assistance uh, in this sense at the time, but uh, what, what clearly happened was political decisions were made. Um, people who were previously eligible found themselves not eligible. Um, those changes were made so that people couldn't access that scheme. Um, so there was, no, there was no ongoing work in that space uh, from 2016 through to February 2022 um, to make sure that uh, people who, uh, through various uh, retrofittings or um, building programs at their own properties, couldn't be taken out of harm's way. So clearly there was a need, there was a need for that comprehensive um, buyback program um, to, be, um, uh, to be kept in place up to that point. But, you know, whatever, that is the history. Uh, we're at a point now where last year uh, the state and federal government funded um, a program which Councillor Davis spoke about earlier, um, uh, which she said was the model of a council program that they decided to defund. Um, so council, the LNP, decided to defund a program but then said it was so good uh, that other levels of government took it up um, with gusto, and we're, we're seeing now, um, you know, hundreds of homes have been um, transacted through council to be put, to be bought back uh, and to be demolished and to be removed uh, from um, habitable living um, places. So it's clearly that um, the case that this would have been more responsive and we would have been better prepared and communities would have been better prepared if that program had actually continued to roll out. And that's what um, has been called for here. There's obviously a set, um, a set program with the arrangements uh, for the Resilient Homes program. Um, and I think at a minimum, at a minimum, this, this, um, this motion doesn't set specific time frames or specific amounts around it, but at a minimum, Council should commit to funding the administrative processes, this is at a bare minimum, the administrative processes for um, purchasing those homes. So what's happening at the moment is uh, those people will be approved for a ho home buyback. Uh, that data will be sent to Brisbane City Council and Brisbane City Council processes that, negotiates with people, executes um, the purchase of that and all of the costs that are incurred along the way. Um, are being deducted out of that fund, which when you add up all those costs and you go through hundreds of homes that are being purchased and demolished, um, we will probably end up with a situation where a whole lot of money that could have otherwise gone to, um, to retrofitting, to house raising or to purchasing more properties will have been eaten up in administrative costs. So we're not, you know, this motion wasn't about getting up here today and saying 10 million or 50 million or hundreds of millions have to be put in um, uh, into this program from a council point of view, but to make sure that those people who went through hell um, aren't shortchanged through this program, council should at least commit to covering the administrative costs of that program as a, as a bare minimum. Um, you know, it, everyone thought 2011 was the worst. Uh, in many ways, 2022 uh, was certainly different and a lot worse for a bigger number of people in the geographic area in Brisbane. Uh, so that program around retrofitting and purchasing homes wasn't just contained to people who experienced river flooding, but for the very first time uh, for people who experienced uh, overland flow flooding and um, creek flooding as well, particularly what used to be called flash flooding, I guess. And that kind of flood uh, now is no longer academic. It's not sort of sitting on those maps saying this is the, the one in 100, uh, in some cases the one in 500 or one in 1,000 uh, year flood in some of the assets um, that we have here in Council. Uh, that is now what actually happened. Uh, it's the reality of living in Brisbane. Uh, and the concern is that without Council um, committing to this in the long term uh, and having residents' backs in the long term, that we're going to see people shortchanged through uh, this process. So, 
in calling on council to properly fund their contribution um, to this scheme, uh, at a bare minimum, we should be seeing um, a proactive approach from Brisbane City Council that doesn't shortchange residents. Um, too many people had a bad experience from, uh, from this council through the 2022 floods, as we litigated some of those. We've certainly done that over the last 12 months, but earlier tonight, um, people, people saw um, uh, as a result of 20 years of political decisions, uh, at Council's own ability completely and utterly hollowed out in responding um, to the disaster as it unfolded. Um, there weren't sandbags, there weren't road closures, there weren't warning messages about, um, uh, about flash flooding, about creek flooding, um, uh, and there weren't uh, sufficient evacuation centres set up. Sure, you know, 14 or 15 months later, some of those recommendations have been acted on. Um, uh, too slowly in some cases, uh, but what this, this motion is seeking is a commitment uh, that Council supports uh, those that were hardest hit during the 2022 flood disaster and many of them in the 2011 flood disaster as well. Council commits to supporting them uh, in a long-term ongoing way. So it's not an outrageous motion, uh, it's quite a sensible and measured one. Uh, in, in putting out there um, our, our council, this council's commitment to supporting those people that did it most tough during that 2022 flood disaster. So um, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure if the LNP, after hearing Councillor Davis's ringing endorsement of that council program earlier uh, today in supporting this coming off the table, that they're going to support this motion in calling on the Lord Mayor. That's, after all, what we are all here to do, to represent our communities. Uh, here in City Hall, be our community's voice here in City Hall and call on the Lord Mayor uh, in his budget to be delivered in June this year to allocate funding to support the ongoing, um, the ongoing home buyback program here in Brisbane. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on the motion. First and foremost, this motion is calling for council funding in the 23-24 budget, the budget which remains in development. We only have six weeks to wait to see what is in this document. But this motion, motion was lodged despite there being an already fully funded $741 million program, which is working perfectly right now, and it isn't costing ratepayers a cent. This buyback program, which has been going now for over 12 months, has over 350 houses which have been approved by the state government for buyback. It is doing exactly what our buyback program did, except this time it is being funded by the federal and state governments. If Councillor Griffith's residents aren't aware that the scheme is currently available, he clearly hasn't done a very good job of advertising this opportunity for them. There are already 78 properties which have been settled and now are in Council's hands. And just last week, we received a further list of 144 properties from the state government, which brings us now to a total of 350 properties. This program is working. It is working perfectly right now. And I'm not quite sure why Councillor Griffiths assumes this program won't continue next year. As I mentioned, there are over 350 houses which have now been approved for buyback. And there are only 78 in Council's hands. I can assure you that we won't be able to transact over 250 properties in the next eight weeks. I do want to respond to Councillor Cassidy's claims about the offer to pay for the administration of delivering or of accepting these properties. I did want to let him know that Council will actually be paying for the demolition of these properties and also the ongoing maintenance. Trust me, the state haven't done it all for us. I would also like to refer to the New Jersey report, which says in the recommendations 3.4, voluntary home purchase scheme, that subject to the availability of state and federal funding, the VHPS be reinstated. So it's very clear, he, even from uh, New Jersey, that we were not meant to be man managing this program, and it was meant to be state and federally funded. So, my message to Councillor Griffiths is that he should get behind the current program, support your residents in making applications if they want their per properties purchased, and when Council can administer a program without committing its ratepayers to solely funding it, it is a good thing. 
there is no need for us to duplicate the current program. For this reason, we will no longer not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Further speakers? Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. Yes. Can I just um, uh, double check? You have indicated, if I'm correct, saying I have already spoken in the debate and I can't speak again. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Following meetings, local law procedures. So, yep, that's it. Um, no further speakers. Councillor Griffiths isn't here to sum up. So we, so we move to the vote on this motion. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Cassidy. Ayes to the right, noes to the left. Ring the bells. There's a, there's a water accident every session. Okay, close the bars. Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being six in favour and 15 against. That motion is lost. Thank you, I now declare the meeting closed.